Uh, there will be three of us helping out today. Uh, I'm Brandi Keller, the horticulture agent here in Harris County for AgriLife Extension. Uh, you'll hear, hear from Shannon in a minute. Shannon Sullivan is an assistant agent, um, a &R agent here in Harris County. And then we have Stephen Bergerhoff. He is the hort horticulture agent in Galveston County. So that's all I have for you. Uh, I will hand this over to Shannon Sullivan now and she will introduce the speaker for today. Thank you and I hope you have a really great time. All right, good morning everybody. My name is Shannon um, and today I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Joe Masopney. So Dr. Masopney earned his PhD in 1998 at Michigan State University. He joined the University of Kentucky in 2002 as a fruit and vegetable specialist. In 2008, he joined the Department of Horticulture Sciences as the Extension Vegetable Specialist. His service appointment extends to homeowners, beginning farmers, county extension agents, and master gardeners. His research interest is to conduct research and demonstration trials to meet the needs of urban agriculture production, including high tunnels and hydroponic slash aquaponics. His extension outreach includes developing online and printed materials for vegetable organic and conventional producers and homeowners, hosts workshops and conferences, and assists county extension agents in serving Texas clientele. All righty, that's all I got. <laughs> it's a pleasure to welcome you, Dr. Masavni. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you, Brandy. Glad to be here. Um, I'm uh, happy to. Uh, share this uh, my experience with hydroponics uh, and like uh, um, give you some little bit more information on this. This is uh, hopefully will become a, a complete course for beginners uh, like yourself or commercial growers who are already, um, you know, like in the first 10 years of their uh, production experience. So there's more room to learn. And the survey, the questionnaire, some of the, uh, the, the question, even if you are a hobbyist or thinking about hydroponic, please complete the survey because uh, we want your input on the challenges you faced uh, trying to learn about hydroponic uh, where uh, or what topics are of interest to you uh, if you were to have a course in front of you. What topics would you like to uh, be included in that course so that we can develop the course to meet the needs instead of developing course with what I think is needed. All right, with well that uh, and one last point, uh, sometimes I talk fast, sometimes I talk slow, so um, I'm hoping it's uh, three hours with uh, 190 slides, but there's a lot of pictures we may uh, finish early, so I appreciate your understanding. And with that, let's uh, get started with uh, the topics of hydroponics gardening, hydroponics production, uh, I guess they're the uh, same thing. Switch two legs. Okay, so the definition of hydroponics is these two uh, points. You're growing plants in a nutrient solution or soilless substrate, so not a soil. Uh, okay, and in a control environment. So uh, a potting mix, you buy a bag of uh, miracle Grow potting mix, that's not a soil. So, this, so in theory, a pot that you fill with potting mix and you grow it in a greenhouse, that's a hydroponic. But the same pot that you put it in your garden or in the patio, that is not hydroponic. It's a little bit uh, confusing why there. But in general, in general, even talking to growers or uh, when when people when people think of hydroponic, they don't think of media. They don't think of uh, potting mix. They think of water, growing plants in in water. Like you see in this in this picture where we have uh, water uh, watercress and they're growing in this deep water culture or here lettuces growing in the NFT, and I'll show you a close up of all these systems. So again, in theory, these uh, cuttings of uh, this, um, I don't know what you call it, cactus plant uh, in pellets, in those uh, uh, pellets, that's artificial soilless media in, inside the building, which is a control environment, 
So in theory, this fits the definition of uh, hydroponic production, but that's not what people understand when you tell them, uh, oh, I'm, I have a hydroponic operation. That's not what comes to mind. Okay, so the advantage of hydroponics is uh, since you're growing in, an, in a system, uh, not in the media, not in the soil, not in, uh, in beds, there's no weeding. Uh, if there are any use of herbicides, it's usually around the outside of the greenhouse or on the soil uh, on the, under the systems, uh, but uh, we try not to use any herbicide inside the greenhouse at all. Okay, uh, pest management is simplified really not by uh, choice. Uh, it's really forced on us because there's very few uh, products available, but we're lucky to know that more and more uh, uh, products, pesticides, whether organic, whether or, uh, insecticides or fungicides, and more and more organic options are are coming into the market. So that's nice to know. So things are looking better for the hydro hydroponic industry. Faster crop production cycle. By that I mean uh, lettuce uh, in the field can take up to two months, three, two and a half months. Uh, whereas uh, it's 30, 35 days uh, in, in, in a control environment uh, and can be year round in the greenhouse, can be year round. And because it's can, uh, year round and higher crop density, because unlike in the field, you don't need room for the tire tracks and for the alleyways and all this, uh, you can have uh, more plants per square foot and you can also go vertical, you know, like in some of the systems that I show you a picture of, you can go uh, vertical. Uh, so then you can have uh, sometimes what we say a factor of 20. So like one acre of a greenhouse is all equivalent to 20 acres in the field, sometimes 50. One acre uh, greenhouse going up with, you know, multiple layers and year round production because it's control environment. You can, is one acre is equivalent to 50 acres in the field. And uh, science have told us that yes, you have higher uh, resource use efficiency, uh, meaning uh, you save 90% of the water uh, for example, by that I mean uh, to grow the same crop in a greenhouse, you use 10% of the water that you would use in the field to, to grow the same amount of that crop. Okay, uh, fuel, electricity, all those there are savings uh, that go there uh, with uh, advantages of hydroponic production. Now, I'm going to show you different types of systems uh, from the easiest to the most complicated, most efficient and uh, most user friendly and all that. Uh, each one has its own advantages, uh, but to, when you want to uh, start even as a hobby, ask yourself these questions here. What space do you have? Uh, do you want to add lighting? Will then that tell you that this is better, more advantage than that one. What is your budget? A lot of people think that, oh, it's, uh, it's easy and cheap. Uh, no, the cost adds up quickly. And how much time do you have? Some systems are less, uh, uh, you know, less, uh, what do you call them, hands-on, you know, can be automated. And some systems, uh, you know, they have electricity pumps running all the time and you have to go there every day to check, make sure everything's running. So ask yourself this, and please do not uh, get into hydroponic as a as a passion. You know, like you get excited, like a kid in a candy store. And you just want that. I want candy. You, uh, you no, please. It's a lot of work. I mean, you if you have kids, you know how babies and uh, that uh, are intensive care. It's think of it as raising a baby. It's uh, intensive care, and you cannot miss a day of work. You have to be there all the time uh, to be uh, to. to to avoid any uh, mistakes that can ruin and kill all the plants. So this is this has to be a mental exercise. You do the numbers, you talk to economists, you talk to us, we'll teach you the production. Uh, do not jump into it and then say uh, it will get better. Okay, so uh, the uh, let's start with the different uh, systems of uh, hydroponic production. Uh, there are some systems that we call passive because there's no electricity, no pumps. They are the cheapest. 
because the plants just uh, uh, take the nutrient solution and the water, for example, if you are working with a hydroponic bucket, or uh, the plants are floating in a container that has the nutrient solution. Okay, so uh, uh, as, a, as a school exercise or as a hobby in the back, a backyard, just to say I did it and have fun with it, I would recommend uh, doing something like this. Uh, and, but again, it is best suited for small plants like uh, leafy greens, herbs, uh, you know, I mentioned watercress, lettuce, spinach, uh, 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 even even like uh, uh, garlic chives, onion chives, uh, parsley, cilantro, uh, all those plants with, because they have small roots and uh, the foam board can, uh, can support their weight. So uh, one example of a passive system is what I call kiddie pool uh, hydroponic. So you buy a kiddie pool like you see here and you buy insulation foam from uh, uh, Home Depot or any place uh, and then you drill holes. And if you do want to do this, my best advice is drill backward with that circular saw that one that drill holes and drill like a, a two inch hole because these net cups and you'll see a picture close up later. You those you have to buy on Amazon. That's the only thing you buy. And then uh, basically you put the seedling in there and and uh, the roots are in the water. And OK, let me make sure that whenever I say water, I mean nutrient solution. OK, they need nutrients. So the roots are so look, look, I mean, uh, this is the easiest because you just fill it with nutrient solution, no air pump, nothing, but only in the cool time of the year. And I'll explain that uh, later uh, when it comes to how much oxygen is held in the water, uh, uh, cold water or versus warm water. OK, but uh, uh, we know that cold water holds more oxygen in the water. So even without any added oxygen, the plants will survive uh, because uh, they're still they're getting enough water. But you try to grow these same plants in June, July, when the water temperature is 75, 80, they will rot because there's no oxygen. They will rot, they will suffocate. But you can see uh, all kind of lettuces, different types of lettuces. Uh, in this picture here. This is the simplest system. Um, anybody can do it uh, this time of year. Um, lettuce can't tolerate some cold weather, but if it's going to freeze, they, they will not tolerate. But the beauty of this is that uh, uh, it's not easy to carry all this out, but you can take the foam boards, move it in uh, with the, with the uh, plants, with the net cups and everything, and move it into the garage overnight. Uh, to uh, to avoid that uh, freeze or frost, and then next day take them out and put them back uh, in in these uh, kiddie pool. So that's the beauty of it. If you if you do it, don't you don't have to move all that because water weighs uh, a lot. You know, every gallon weighs eight pounds, and this kiddie pool will have at least uh, ten gallons. So here's 80, 90 pounds. It's not easy to lift. So if you if you want to do this and say, oh, there's a minor frost that covering with a blanket is not enough. Take the foam board with the plants, move them all inside to the garage uh, overnight uh, to protect them. So that is the easiest. And if you want to start it with a passion, like just to get excited with the idea and you want to do something, do it this way. OK, and I will show you another option if you don't want uh, to get net cups. Uh, or uh, potting mix, there's another option uh, that is even easier. Uh, okay, so here's how the plant will look uh, bigger. When they are bigger, they will do really well. My advice is that uh, any uh, hole, any uh, try to cover it with the cap, with a piece of aluminum, with anything, because even though the nutrient solution is concentrated, you'll see algae will grow. So to avoid algae growing, try to make the uh, make as little uh, uh, gap open to let light in. Okay, so the the uh, 
passive system, there's really only one type, deep water culture. The example is that kiddie pool. But in terms of active system, where you have to add electricity, pumps, timers, uh, pipes, tubing, this, that, uh, uh, there's all different types uh, of systems available that I will cover in detail here. And of course, with all that uh, extra equipment and infrastructure, you can understand that they are more expensive to begin with. Uh, you can grow small plants, uh, like all the, uh, the leafy greens and small uh, herbs that I mentioned, or you can even grow larger plants. Uh, for example, uh, all the fruiting vegetable, all the tomato, the greenhouse tomato, cucumber, uh, even peppers uh, that uh, they say, tell you or advertise that greenhouse are grown in one type of uh, hydroponic system or another, including Dutch bucket. OK, uh, they can be uh, efficient and can require less attention depending on which system that you are using and depending on the level of automation that you choose. Of course, for example, a, a large scale commercial operation, if you don't have an automatic uh, pH measurement and dosing system that will automatically adjust the pH, uh, forget it because you're going to spend uh, your uh, full time job uh, measuring the pH regularly and adjusting it. So dosing system, you know, control environment, you know, temperature, AC, all that to control the temperature and humidity and light. The more automation you have, uh, the less uh, attention you can spend on it. And so you can focus on the business aspect of uh, procuring seeds and procuring customers and selling and delivering and all this. If you are a commercial uh, producer, my gauge for success is that you're spending at least 50% of your time minimal, if not 75% of your time uh, in the office uh, buying and selling. If you find you're, sp you're spending 50 or 75% of your time in the greenhouse doing the physical work, you are not there yet. There's room for improvement and you're not doing it right. Okay, types of hydroponic systems. Um, and we'll go, we'll show you pictures, we'll show you schematics, I'll show you live pictures of uh, systems that I have. Uh, they include uh, nutrient film technique. So if you hear NFT, from now on, I'll start saying NFT, I'll start saying DWC. Dutch bucket, um, NFT means nutrient film technique, deep water culture or deep flow technique. A lot of people, I rarely see that term DFT, but uh, deep flow technique is deep water culture. So that uh, kiddie pool with that four inches of water with that foam, because you have deep water, it's called deep water culture. That's one example. OK, uh, other names you may hear raft, hydroponic, pond, hydroponic, uh, trough, hydroponic, trough, uh, uh, water culture, raft, water culture. Uh, any combination of these words are all uh, meaning the same thing, deep water culture. OK, um, so the, the one that does not have water, that has a, some type of soilless media is the Dutch bucket. OK, so this is the Dutch bucket is the one that has perlite, has uh, some people use sand, some people use potting mix, but really perlite or the uh, pellets, you know, expanded shale or those uh, uh, pellets uh, uh, is uh, best suited for them. Uh, of course, uh, aeroponics is uh, becoming uh, very popular and NASA has a big interest in that just because imagine in space or on log, long uh, space trips, uh, a small amount of water can grow a lot of plants. Uh, aero means air. So instead of hydroponic like water, hydroponic uh, water, now it's air. And I'll show you what I mean by aeroponic. And then vertical tower is hydroponic, but going vertical instead of uh, uh, horizontal space. And I'll show you, like I said, pictures and schematics and describe each one of these in detail. And let's start with the NFT uh, system um, and the schematics of this. And here is a 
you know, demo model, you know, like a small one for school or for a hobby that you can buy because for a commercial operation, these lines or these channels, uh, sometimes they're 20 foot long, but you can buy one that's six foot or eight foot uh, for a kit uh, for a show and tell, uh, you know, or school or for your personal use. Uh, by the way, all well, maybe not all, maybe nowadays, maybe 90%. 90% of the lettuce, hydroponic lettuce that you buy is grown in these uh, NFT channels. And it, it, basically it consists of a uh, reservoir for the you know, nutrient solution and a pump that pumps the water to one line, one end. And because of the slope, the water runs down at a thin film that's why it's called film technique and nutrient film technique, hence the name, and comes out at the end and, and uh, goes back into the tank. So this is a recirculating system or what we call closed loop. Nutrient solution goes out, nutrient solution goes to the tank. OK, so um, that is a schematic of that system. Um, the, uh, the channels that basically look like gutters. So I know some people who take have taken four inch or even six inch PVC pipe and drilled holes. And instead of buying the commercial gutters, they made their own. The very thin layer or film of the water, I remember water, I mean nutrient, runs on the bottom, wetting the plants that are sitting and touching the bottom. So they soak up the nutrient solution, but they're not completely covered so they are still getting room to breathe and space to breathe. So you don't need air pump uh, anywhere in the system. OK, so the reservoir is used to hold the nutrient solution and with a small pump and you add the nutrient solution, you adjust the pH initially and then you uh, uh, the uh, you have to refill it after uh, let's say every two weeks because the plants are using some of the water and then some of the water is evaporating so you have to adjust it biggest problem with people using the system is that they are not ta taught or told how to refill the system they just refill it with the same initial concentration which is not what you want to do uh, if you want to do this you refill it with half the concentration that you started with. OK, and I can talk into this. I will describe this in more detail. This is very versatile system because uh, because uh, like here's the schematic. Uh, they don't the pump does not have to be under the system. This pump can be in another room uh, as long as you have enough pump that can deliver. And I mean, I've seen uh, a thousand gallon uh, uh, reservoir buried in the soil in a huge operation like this that will deliver water to all these. So uh, it's very versatile so as you know the parts and how they work together. You can build build it and design it any way you like. OK, and this picture is same schematic. I just show you the flow, the water flow it goes here and the slope brings it back down and goes back to the tank. OK. Now, I mentioned the slope. Uh, I've read anywhere from 1% to 2 to 3%. 1% if it's a small line uh, length, you know, let's say six feet. But if you have the commercial operation where those channels are 20 foot long, like you see here, then maybe 2 to 3% slope is better. OK, and the channel, the commercial, uh, you know, custom made commercial brands, they come in all shapes, rectangular, square and all that. And uh, ideally the reservoir ideally is better if you can put it underground or even as a hobby system, but put foam all around it to insulate it from the uh, air so that the water temperature does not change too much because you're dealing uh, with a hobby system. You're dealing with 40, 45 gallon that can easily warm up uh, with the weather. 
So you, uh, but if you insulate it or if you have a bigger tank and bury it, then uh, soil will act as an insulation and uh, the water temperature will not change. And if you want to be a commercial, even as a small scale commercial operation, not like this large, if you bury it, uh, um, uh, water temperature uh, remaining constant is better. And then you can guarantee to grow lettuce in the middle of summer, even when the air temperature is 100, just because that water is a constant 70 degrees, for example, instead of became 85, 90, because that tank is above water, is above uh, the surface. Okay, and here's examples of the um, homemade uh, system, PVC, okay, uh, or uh, commercial that, you know, rectangular or rectangular, what do you call that, trapezoid or square, Whatever works, it doesn't matter. You, you, you can even from wood uh, and build it your own. Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, I've seen all kinds of creative ideas and, and you can make it work. Uh, okay, so uh, of course, um, you will have issue of algae growing even with a commercial operation because anytime you have nutrient and anytime you have light, algae will grow. So. Uh, but the beauty of the NFT system is that even that 20 foot uh, long channel with the weight of all the letters on it, any person can lift it and carry it uh, to the harvest uh, table and you, get, you harvest it, you open the lid, you pressure, you, you use a pressure uh, washer and, uh, you know, clean, clean it on the inside, uh, put new plants, new seedlings in there and return it to the system. Because it is not connected, uh, it's not glued or screwed to the system, it's just sitting there and, uh, and let me show you here uh, close up. So, for example, this channel, if I un turn off the pump, and I unhook this hose, this what we call spaghetti tubing uh, here where it drips water. If I unhook it, then this uh, eight foot ch channel is uh, it can easily be removed because it is just sitting on the, on the other end. It's just sitting in this PVC pipe so that it can drain. It's not uh, bolted. It's, there's no zip ties holding it at all. The only connection is that you have to unhook uh, this uh, uh, drip tubing and then that is very flexible. And like I said, even a 20 foot long, one person can lift it and carry it for harvest. And here are uh, our system at the Dallas Center, uh, all kind of basil plants, uh, garlic chives, onion chives, we've grown all kind of plants. Uh, and, and this is the hobby system or the educational kit that I bought. Uh, see, it has four channels, uh, uh, 12 plants per line, so 48 plants total. And the foot is, the footprint of this is about four times uh, six, four foot times uh, six foot. Uh, and then that tank below it is, uh, is uh, can hold uh, 45 gallons. Okay, so 48 plants in a, what did I say, six times four, uh, 24 square feet. So how many plants per square foot? Uh, 48 divided by 24, two plants per square uh, foot. Remember that number because we'll compare it to another system. Uh, 48 plants uh, in uh, 24 square feet, that's two plants per square foot. That's still better than uh, in the field if you're trying to grow basil because basil in the field, they plant them one foot apart. Okay, here they are six inches apart. And what's interesting is that basil, I know when you pull a basil plant from the garden, it has a huge root system. Whereas here in this NFT, which is like two inch by four inch uh, wide, that channel is two inch high by two, four inch wide, the root system is small. The plant uh, does not have to make energy to make more roots to seek out uh, water and nutrients. The water and nutrient is coming to it. 
So my logic, I know plants don't think, but if they were thinking, they say, hey, why should I make uh, energy to make more roots? More food is coming to me. I'm just making roots to replace what rotted and what died because roots have a, have a, a lifespan and then they rot or die or become less efficient. So the plants make uh, roots, new roots to replace them. So the plants will adapt and I've grown kale. I've grown Swiss chard in, in these channels that you see here. Uh, and uh, we're still, um, you know, have good production. OK, and uh, here is the, our other system that's on the rooftop greenhouse. Please come visit us at the Dallas Center. We'll be happy to show you. In this experiment, we were testing different uh, media that were going into these channels. And again, here, this is the same footprint, uh, four by six, and, uh, same thing, um, just a different brand. And uh, you're doing uh, uh, research on the different media. Like here, this is rock wool that the lettuce is growing in it. This is called CBOP, C-B-O-P, that the lettuce is growing in, and Jiffy pellets, and uh, I forget the last one. Okay, so compared to a commercial operation system where you have I mean, they don't talk by number of greenhouse, they talk by, uh, by square feet. Oh, I have a million square foot operation. Do you know how much is a million square foot operation? A typical greenhouse is 30 by 96. So that uh, is uh, three, let's say 3,000 square feet. So a million divided by 3,000, that's like having 333 greenhouses uh, connected and to end. Like here, this operation here is like a 33 greenhouses connected uh, in one big operation. Of course, there's economies of scale. The cost of one greenhouse, you don't multiply it by 333 to get that million square feet. You pay a lot less proportionally um, because, you know, uh, you should know. Anyway, you see, you see here that they have square channels uh, here. Uh, this is a big space in between these uh, lines. Like why all this empty space here? Uh, this is a waste of space, uh, whereas these are much closer, more efficient use uh, of the space, even though they're growing bok choy and looks like full uh, size bok choy, not mini, not baby bok choy. So uh, when I look at this picture, I lament on the wasted space between these channels. Uh, they must have a reason for it that I cannot figure out. Looking at this these are not my picture. I uh, got them from a colleague who visited China years ago. Okay, so the pros and cons of an uh, NFT system. Um, you don't have, you, there's no need for an air pump uh, to add air to the nutrient solution because the dissolved oxygen root zone is always high because that this thin film layer that's running in that, that channel is exposed to the air. So there's always air uh, oxygen ex exchange with the water. Okay, so you don't have to worry about the plants rotting. The cons, the water temperature fluctuates with the air temperature if that tank is small and if that tank is above the soil surface. So if you have a kit, a small system uh, for a school or that, be aware that the water temperature uh, can become an issue. And if there's a power outage, the plants will wilt quickly because they are uh, not sitting in water permanent. In the, in the deep water culture, in that kiddie pool, the plants are sitting in the water. Uh, they will never wilt. Your concern is that in the summer that they may wilt only because the uh, roots ran out of oxygen in that water. But in the NFT system, because they're sitting in that channel and then they're getting wet, uh, wetted with that nutrient solution that passes, if there's no power outage, they can wilt. Of course, uh, does it mean um, instantly? No, I know some people will have it on a four hour cycle, four hour on, four hour off, one hour on, two hours off, oh, and some big operation, they have that system running 24 hours a day. Uh, or they all work, okay? 
you may have to adjust the on off cycle to your conditions. OK, don't say Joe set to one hour on two hours off. Well, maybe your greenhouse is hotter. Maybe you're in a location facing the sun that and it, your location warms up instantly by seven o'clock that you don't know, adjust it. Pay attention to the plant. Look at the cell, see if it's dry and adjust the timer accordingly. OK. All right, so that was the NFT. The second one, most popular one, is the deep water culture, DWC. If you're reading in the literature or online, you may hear floating raft, floating trough, pond culture. All of those are um, synonymous terms. And the concept of it is that uh, think of the kiddie pool. OK, you have a container holding a certain depth of water, so it's not a thin film. It's at least four inches or six inches to be counted at the as deep water culture. And you have a foam board. OK, and in that foam board, you cut holes and then the net cup holds the plants. The roots are permanently floating in that nutrient solution. And you need uh, an air pump to continuously add air to that water. So there's no water movement. OK, there's no water coming in and coming out. That water is static. That's why you need to have uh, air added because it's static. It's not moving to to mix with the air and get more air uh, oxygen dissolved. OK. So that is the schematic diagram and you see here this is this operation has uh, I mean uh, what is that 20 30 foot wide by 50 foot long if I remember the operation floating in this water and you see all these uh, foam. Now uh, when I say foam board the standard size is two by four. OK. That is the standard size. So even if you want to make your own, you don't want to buy pre molds, the pro commercial brands. Uh, and I'll show you a picture of that. You want to make your own from that pink foam board you buy from Home Depot. You can please make them two by four because when it's fully loaded with plants and it has, uh, let's say, uh, 36 plants, each one is about half a pound. That's 18 pounds with the foam board, let's say, with a little bit of water on the roots, 20 pounds. You don't want more than 20 pounds for anybody to lift without risking back pain and lifting it like this and then moving it so it's not as comfortable. Uh, uh, so make sure the foam, the standard size is two by four. So each one of these here, so here's the board, here's the board, here's the board. Each one of these is two by four. And you'll notice there's no alleyways. That's the beauty of the trough or the deep water culture because you don't have to go to that plant. You can push all the foam boards to come to you uh, for harvest. And that means you have to follow a certain protocol when you are using deep water culture. You have the harvest end here on this end and you have the start end on that side. So you you uh, you take these foam boards from here to harvest them, whether from one row, two rows or all rows. You harvest them, clean the boards, uh, reload them with seedlings. You go to this end, you push all the boards uh, and then you put the new ones here. That's why when you look from this end, the starting end to the harvest end, you see, you see the plants are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. You don't want to randomly say, hey, I want this one in the middle here. I want that red one. Then uh, it's going to make life complicated. So uh, if you do want that one, then you have to move it and then put things back and reorganize. But the, bar, but the point is everything has to be on one end and you harvest from one end, you push everything forward and you put the new boards that are have the new by new boards. I mean uh, boards with the new seedlings on this one end. OK. So anything minimum six inches of water is considered deep water culture. 
And but you don't want less than six inches because even lettuce will have will have roots that can be six inches deep, and you don't want them to touch the bottom and risk rotting or anything. So minimum six inch uh, for to be considered deep water culture and work efficiently. But you do need aeration because this is a static pond and the plants are sitting in that water. So you need to add aeration. OK, now I mentioned earlier uh, the cold water holds more oxygen uh, than warm water. Let's look at this figure. OK, this figure here is the water temperature. So. Um, so what is that? Uh, 28 is about 82. So let's say here's 82. Uh, and this is the parts per million of dissolved uh, oxygen in, in that water. And you'll see as the water temperature uh, increases, the level of oxygen dissolved in that water decreases. And if we want, uh, if we, uh, they tell you, uh, science tells you that five parts per million here is the minimum that plants uh, need to survive. But practice tells us that, uh, I mean, application real, uh, uh, that you need at least uh, seven or eight. So I prefer to tell yourself I need eight parts per million of water. So that means the water, if it's static, uh, if you're not adding uh, any air pump to it, it has to be around uh, 82 maximum. Even then, even though they're not dead, but they're, they are stressed, so they're not growing. OK, so just because they are not dead when the water temperature is 82, even if it still has eight parts per million oxygen, uh, it's uh, their plants are stressed. So cooler, cooler temperature or uh, an air pump is uh, for a small system is cheap. Uh, you know, go to any uh, uh, pet store, you know, they sell fish, you'll find, you'll find an aquarium pump that would do just fine. Okay. Okay, so uh, if you have a large system, like the picture that I showed you before, or this one pond here that is uh, 10 by 25 foot, then there are some uh, Venturi or Molly, I'm sorry, I'm going to butcher the name, Molly R, uh, pump that as it is pumping the water for circulation, it's adding oxygen to it. Uh, then it's very easy instead of having, uh, you know, one approach to adding air uh, to, to this. But you see a beautiful operation uh, where the width and the length has to be a multiple of two. Remember the boards are two by four. So if this is 10 foot wide, then you can put five boards with the two foot uh, end this way. And if this is, I don't think it's 30 because you need a multiple of four if it's going, if two is this way, so let's say it's 32 because the 32 is a multiple of four. Don't make it five because then you want to cut your boards two by four. You're going to have one foot extra. It's not fun having a board that's one foot wide or leave a one foot gap. God forbid you leave one foot gap. Uh, too much light, too much algae growing. OK, so the width and the uh, length have to be a multiple of two or a multiple of four and a multiple of four. OK, because you want uh, you want them to be loose so they are uh, they can move easily, not act tight that they cannot slide uh, next to each other, but you don't want a one inch gap between the boards. OK, so you you build it. So here is one where it's not a plastic. This is homemade with a wood frame and they use the pond liner uh, and uh, to, to grow it. You can do this as a hobby using a pond liner and put a couple of layers, you know, just for backup. And so there's no risk of leak. But commercial operation, a pond liner is not permitted to be used because it's not food grade. So if you want to sell, then you need to get food grade liner and usually they're white and they're thick, uh, unlike the pond liner, which is thin. That's why because it's thin, I said put two or three layers so they don't scratch or cut or whatever and leak. Uh, so you need a pond liner if you're selling. 
if you're not selling for your personal use, uh, pond, uh, pond liner is fine. Uh, okay, pond liner or commercial grade liner, uh, food grade liner, if you are selling. You add the water, and then of course the foam is about an inch and a half to two inch thick, so you don't fill it all the way to the top. It has to be like two, two and a half inches below the edge, or leave room for the board uh, to sit on. You, uh, you adjust it, you add the nutrient, you adjust the pH, and then the water is recirculated or you add the air pump. And, uh, and uh, if you add, you add lights, even better. And uh, you know, life is good, plants are happy and they will grow. Then your only concern is uh, are bugs or grasshoppers or worms are going to move in. Once you take care of these steps, then um, then um, the only thing we have to do in, the, in terms of maintenance is uh, check the EC and uh, check the nitrate, see if it's uh, the water level drops, you then time to add a uh, new solution. But remember half the original, half the concentration of the original solution um, and uh, check the EC regularly. Uh, sometimes the EC will get too high, then you may have to dump some, uh, let's say 50 gallon of that water, dump it, use it in the garden somewhere because it still has nutrients, and then add fresh water just to adjust the PA, the EC, keep the EC um, within limit. And usually that's, uh, let's say, less than 2000 uh, units. Okay, look at this huge operation. You can search uh, Muchi. Muchi Farms in Canada. You can see their operation. Uh, look at these beautiful foam boards. Uh, no, absolutely no, um, uh, no um, gap, no light to enter. But there they have a different approach. They don't slide the channels because these channels uh, are, they, I mean, they're foam, but they lock one on top of each other like a puzzle, like a, like a, uh, Lego, like Lego, they kind of attach to each other. Uh, so, um, so there's no movement. So you see, all of these are the same age, and all of this line is the same age. So when this is harvested, the whole line is harvested at once, not. Uh, partially, like I said, you harvest from here and you push everything, and then you load it from this end. No, this whole line is harvested, and the people, and and they alternate. So you see. Old, new, old, new, old, new, and ultimate. Uh, lots of ways, as long as you understand the concept, and as long as you know, hey, I need 30 days um, or sometimes 21 days, depending on time of the year uh, for this to harvest, then you, and I have this order coming, uh, that's when you say how many new plants you have to see. But a typical day activity, of a commercial operation is every day you harvest, you pack, you transplant, you know, like you put the new seedling and you re, uh, put the foam board back and then you seed. Every day you're doing a little bit of these three. So every day you have a constant supply of all plants for harvest, uh, plants for transplanting, young plants for transplanting and seeds that you just seeded. And here's Lone Star lettuce grower. See here, uh, these are not uh, two by four. They decided to go with a smaller. No, actually they are two by four. Uh, looking at the number of plants, the picture is misleading. I was told they're not, but the number tells me they are two by four. Five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 32 plants. So yeah, that's two by four. Um, but uh, again, you see how there's very little gap. I mean, you see the gap, you see how they can slide, but not enough to cause. And this is a type of operation where uh, you can move them all from back from the wet wall towards you or move them from this side to this side to harvest and all this. Here's an alleyway. Uh, so here is, if this is four foot uh, board, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So this is, Seven times four, 28 foot wide, a little bit over 20, 28 and two inches wide uh, trough. And then let's say two, 
a foot alleyway and then 28 and then two foot. So that's telling me uh, this is a 30 foot wide uh, greenhouse and they're using every square inch. Uh, the little bit of alleyway where the uh, columns that support the greenhouse are there, uh, maximizing the use of that greenhouse. Beautiful operation, that's what you need. Okay, so, and this is the typical foam board. In the old days, they used to be, um, you know, you had to make your own, and we used to get net cups and fill it with media, and some of that media dissolved and fell into the trough in the water, so once in a while you had to use a shop vac and clean it. Nowadays, they come pre-molded, and they have that square hole in it to fit the Grodan cube. For, because Grodan uh, won and became the most commonly used product as media, and Grodan is spelled G-R-O-D-A-N. Uh, that's a brand name. Basically, it's rock wool and it comes in a square, and I'll show you close up of it later. So this one is 5, 10, 15, 20, 20. Here, uh, this one has 28 plants per board, uh, two by four boards. OK, they come 18 if you plan on getting bigger plants or 36 or even 64 uh, plants that uh, you would use those or even 120. You would use those for seedlings, you know, like where you're growing your seedlings, if you like, before you transplant them. So again, uh, standard size um, two by four and the uh, commercial grade is very hard uh, foam. Like it's one inch thick, but it's very hard. You cannot bend it. Whereas the one inch thick foam that you buy from Home Depot can is flexible. So it's not as strong as the uh, pre molded commercial grade uh, foam boards or raft boards. That's another. I call them foam boards. Okay. So this is our system at the rooftop greenhouse. So this is uh, what is it? Uh, 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 what we call deep water culture. Basically, it's a rectangular tank. We fill it with the nutrient solution. We add the air pump. We put the foam board and we grow plants in it like so. So here is some, uh, I think it's called uh, Ukahijiki, Japanese plant. And here's some uh, lettuce and here's some uh, purple bok choy and some flowering plants. Um, and they did fine. Actually, when we did this uh, study, we did not add uh, air pump because to prove the point that they can grow when the uh, water temperature is cool, is cool enough uh, in the fall, uh, winter, uh, early spring season. And here is uh, more of our system where we are growing different kinds of lettuces. Uh, you see the foam board. Uh, Actually, the two by four, we had to cut it because this is not four foot long. It was less, so we don't have uh, 28 plants. We have 18 plants. Uh, anyway, um, without any oxygen, they can grow very well. Uh, but again, these are in a greenhouse, so it's air conditioned, it have excellent uh, temperature control and uh, uh, not very bright because it's in the fall, winter, and the early spring, so they did very well. And uh, these are the uh, in the greenhouse, not in the rooftop greenhouse, what we call the botany house, and I'll show you a video where we use the foam board from uh, Home Depot. And each, uh, this is four, uh, four by four, and it has uh, 36 plants. Six times six has 36 plants. This one is where we use the, the uh, we drill the hole, and we uh, use the net cups, and we use the potting mix. This is the old, old days, how it started. So you can see how it can be messy. Uh, some of the media fa falls on the outside and some of the media falls in the water. And so a lot more cleaning. So when the rock wool mold came in the market, everybody switched because labor is expensive. 
I mean, think of the labor you have to put to fill the pots and then transplant them and then clean them and remove the net cup. Whereas with the grow dan cubes, the rock wool cubes, you, you add the seed in there, you transplant it, and then you when you harvest it, you throw it away. A lot less labor and labor is money and uh, labor is time and time is money. Okay. Uh, a few last pictures before we take our first break. And then these here is uh, where we added air pump to do a study to prove that yes, cold water holds uh, more oxygen, but even then in the winter, in the spring, when the water temperature is cold and the plants are doing well, if you add air pump, the plants will do better. So, by well, they can grow and they will produce, let's say will take 30 days. Uh, when you add air, they they will uh, can be ready in 25 days because they are happy, they're eating well, they're drinking well, they're uh, not uh, getting tired, you know, because they have to gasp for air or whatever. They, everything is coming to them. So you gain some time. So as a hobby, you can skip the air if you're growing lettuce, all those plants that uh, in cold water over the cool season. Um, but uh, you, you want to be more efficient because you want to sell, get an air pump and add the water. We, uh, there is definitely big improvement. I think this is a good time to stop. We are three minutes uh, before we start a new topic, uh, top of the hour. Is this OK? We can and come back five minutes from now. Dr. Masabni, that is perfect. We do have one question that we feel you may be able to address quickly before we go to break. The question sure. is, is the Lone Star Lettuce Grower example a push operation and how do they harvest in that example? Push operation? I don't know what you mean by push. Let's go back to uh, uh, yes, of course. If you mean by push, like the foam boards come to you, yes, uh, they have a, uh, a, a PVC that's uh, with foam surrounding so that it can float, and then they 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 uh, when they pull on the rope, they pull it this way, and then they uh, it will bring all those line uh, foam boards to you to this end. Uh, for harvest, OK? Excellent. Uh, yes, it is. Uh, if you mean push, pushing the foam board to come to you, absolutely. Uh, because this definitely does not look like a one time harvest. All of them at once you see different ages, so they are harvesting individually. Uh, in, in, uh, like this block uh, at one time. And then they replanted uh, a block. I don't know why they're leaving gaps in between. Maybe they don't have such a big order coming. That's the only reason. It's not necessary to leave gaps. Uh, like uh, this crop will not interfere with that crop. None of that. I think it has to do with the order that they have. Someone ordered uh, this many plants of uh, bok choy, so they planted this many. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Masabni. All right, welcome back. I hope uh, you're learning. Um, we'll try to go a little bit fast, make sure um, keep you excited about hydroponic. So deep flow techniques, trough system. I'm sorry. You can hear me now. OK, so um, the uh, deep flow technique, uh, think of the deep water culture, but the water is moving. Let's say there's some water circulation with it. OK, uh, that's really uh, what's the advantage of that is that um, uh, sometimes circulating water like it goes here to the sump tank, to like a reservoir. Um, it imitates the, the uh, nutrient film technique, the water circulation, um, less problems, less uh, static water comes with algae, whereas uh, moving water maybe have less algae issues. Uh, um, I don't know, better mixing of the nutrient, uh, constant mixing of nutrient water. Uh, I, I don't know. 
I don't know. Anyway, this is a high tunnel, and you see these are eight foot wide. Be, uh, must be because there are two boards next to each other, and um, uh, there's a lot of wasted space, in my opinion, uh, with these all these alleyways. You remember in the other picture where it was end to end, or in this picture where, um, and even though there's one foot gap, that's not even necessary because you can have that big pond, if you like, from end to end, um, as long as it's multiple of four, so that foam uh, can mo move around, the m move the foams to you. You don't have to go to them to uh, to bring them to the harvest table. Otherwise, they are about this uh, everything, same concept, same material, same thing. It's just the water, whether flowing or static, that's the only difference. OK, so pros and cons of deep water culture system. Um, uh, the um, it's low, <coughs> low maintenance because uh, easy to build, easy to maintain because there's very few moving parts. Uh, plants can survive without electricity for a long time. Uh, let's say a power outage even over the weekend in the middle of July, where the plants are not going to rot uh, completely because they are sitting in water complete uh, compared to a NFT system where the power outage in the middle of July and the, you know those little plant roots uh, are now hanging in the air and they're not being wetted uh, will definitely dry out. Um, OK, and due to the large volume of water, remember here, I mean, you got uh, look at this, uh, how many gallons, hundreds and hundreds of gallons in that big pond compared to a 45 gallon uh, in, a, in a system that uh, you have more stability or fewer changes over time with the electro EC, electrical conductivity, pH and temperature. The cons means the what's negative about the deep water culture system is you need aeration, which means you need a water air pump running 24 hours a day. Uh, initially, you need uh, a large amount of fertilizer initially to fill the pond or to replace it if there's a leak or uh, something messed up uh, with the EC and you have to dump half the water and put fresh water and do all that. And um, uh, the same advantage that the large volume of water is makes the water temperature stable. It can also be a negative because in the uh, spring when it warms up, that water is still a little cool and it's going to be two weeks for it to catch up uh, to warm up, you know, uh, to warm up. Now in a small system, we had uh, the, uh, these small systems that are four by four and one foot deep. We track the air temperature uh, the uh, in yellow, and we track the water temperature. Um, you know, on, on July uh, 5th, 14 in 2020, and look at the air temperature at midnight 75. The hottest was what uh, 80 something uh, around uh, 10 o'clock, and then started dropping around 7 p.m. Um, so between 10 and 5. The air temperature, because it's in a it's in a greenhouse, uh, some kind of um, climate control with the wet wall, and I'll tell you more about the wet wall. Um, but you know, still 82, unlike the ideal greenhouse where some of them are high tech and they have air conditioning, you can maintain the temperature at 75. Here we're lucky that they were 82. Uh, but look at the water temperature. The water temperature, uh, you know, it, it rises in the afternoon because it got heated, uh, accumulated heat all day and rises up to midnight. The highest really was around midnight. And then because of the cooling down overnight, it cools down and continue cooling down. So when the it's interesting that they're, they're the opposite. Um, you know, when the uh, the water temperature was cooler than um, in the middle of the day than the air temperature. OK, which is which is nice what you want to what you want. Uh, I mean, here water temperature 75 is great for the plants, but what's not good is that that night that water temperature is reaching 85, 90, uh, even though it's for a short period. So if you have a small system like this, 
and you want to uh, cool down the temperature, then think about uh, chilling the uh, cooling the water at night instead of all day. Not necessary to cool it all day. OK. Common crops in NFT and deep water culture system that we've studied so far, all the leafy greens that you see here and more. You want to grow water spinach, you anything that is not a fruiting vegetable, not a huge root system, not a tree uh, will grow well. All these herbs and more. OK, like here is something we are growing. I showed you this before with the watercress, different kinds of watercress, different kinds of basil, different kind of lettuces, and they all did well. Uh, you really have to love your vegetable because there's so much to eat. And here spinaches, uh, spinach, different kinds of spinaches will do in the work. And again, this is deep water culture. This is about six inches deep with the foam boards and they were growing, uh, doing well. OK. And again, here are the same plants. Um, about a week apart, see how fast they can grow. Um, between the top pictures and the uh, pictures at the bottom. Oh, sorry. And what happened? And this is uh, a, a week later when they are ready for harvest uh, spinach. Um, lettuce sometimes, that's a personal opinion. Uh, field lettuce always tasted better than greenhouse lettuce. Lettuce. I mean, maybe I don't have strong taste buds. I always call lettuce crunchy water. But some sometimes field lettuce, sometimes a little bit bitter or there's some, some kind of taste. Uh, that you can enjoy, but uh, spinach, um, I could not tell any difference or other other uh, leafy greens. I could not tell the difference between a field uh, or hydroponically grown crops. But again, that's like I said, maybe my taste buds are not that sensitive. Here is a commercial operation of uh, in Japan of spinach year round. I'm I'm impressed because we have a challenge with spinach. Um, it's very sensitive to diseases and in, uh, in the when it warms up, they found the trick of growing it uh, year round in Japan. But so what you see here are the foam boards. Uh, and this is about um, looks like four inches, not any deeper. And this is the uh, for, uh, for, uh, food grade liner. You see it's white color. I can tell it's that food grade liner. So it's a very good quality. It's because it's a commercial operation. They're not using the pond liner. Um, they have some algae problem, but uh, they're doing well. I'm sure I'm very sure that the spinach variety they are choosing has something to do with it because you see how it's growing and how the leaf are shape are are different than our uh, spinach that we are familiar with. So the combination of unique varieties adapted for those for that climate and the ideal conditions, I'm sure they have some kind of climate control control like see these heaters uh, to, to add extra heat uh, allowed them to succeed. But uh, without that spinach variety, uh, I don't think it would be. be uh, so don't think that it, the point I'm trying to make is don't think that hey, Japan was able to grow spinach. I can grow it here. What variety they chose they are using is number one question you need to get get that. And that's 50% of the success. Everything else is just all the hardware and the management skills and practices that you are doing. OK. So um, uh, here in this situation, they can grow uh, 19 cycles of uh, crops per year. So divide 365 by 19. So what that uh, what's uh, nice quickly. 365 divided by 19. Uh, 19 uh, days per cycle, so that must be. Um, baby spinach. OK, unless it's a cut and grow and they're counting every cut, 
I am sure it's cut and grow because you could not grow from seedling to harvest maturity and then throw it away in 19 days and start over. So uh, spinach, the beauty of spinach is cut and grow. So 19 days you cut it, it grow again. So maybe two, three, four cuts and then replace it with the new seedlings like you see here. They have new young plants and here all the plants. That is the trick. It's not uh, 19 day between cuts. That's what it would be. OK, so even when the temperature outside is 100 degree Fahrenheit, they are able to maintain the water temperature below 75. So that is the trick. And we've when we've seen that in our spinach trials, it's much more sensitive and I'll show you pictures of that. It's much more sensitive to uh, hot water temperature than other crops. OK, uh, Dutch bucket. Those are very popular, becoming very popular, and um, they, you can grow all kind of plants from the lettuce to the tomato uh, or cucumber or large fruiting plants. Those, it's not water. They are basically using a soilless substrate. Substrate, OK? So Dutch bucket, you fill the bucket with media. Perlite is the most common because it's light, it's cheap. Uh, clay spheres, uh, clay pellets, what I've called clay pellets before, cocoa pellets, cocoa, pe uh, cocoa uh, fiber. It's irrigated with flood and drain method. Um, and you know, you put them in a stand. The, the Dutch bucket system can be recirculating what we call closed loop or drain to waste. And I'll show you in, uh, well, I have both. I'll show you in the video or I have both. So you fill the reservoir with water, nutrient, adjust the pH, do everything like everything else, and then you the drip uh, is on uh, is on a timer, okay. Um, but uh, you can grow, like I said, any type of crop. So in this schematic diagram, they are growing tomatoes, and here is the reservoir with the pump. The water pump uh, pressure uh, trips it with two lines. I barely see the white tubing here, two tubing per bucket. And then the excess water comes out into this uh, uh, return pipe and it can either go to waste. Uh, that's what we call the open loop. Nutrient solution goes out, does not come back or it comes back here to the reservoir tank, what we call closed loop system. Very simple schematic. Again, once you understand the concept, you don't have to buy a kit that costs maybe $2,000. You can get uh, five gallon buckets and build it your own uh, if you know what all the parts are and how they work together. OK, and here is um, um, the growing tomato in a, at the, um, the Lone Star. Uh, Texas Lone Star show that we have here in Dallas. They have a greenhouse and I went to visit and they grown greenhouse tomato. Uh, whereas I've grown tomatoes, I've grown sweet potatoes, I've grown uh, all kind of crops. And I have both systems, the closed loop and the open loop system. And in the video, I'll show you them uh, in more detail. Um, so here is the open loop system and you see that the waste uh, is uh, still usable. I mean, you see, look, uh, still nice fresh uh, fertilizer. So I used to collect it and use it uh, somewhere else in my vegetable garden. Um, so beautiful tomatoes. Um, of course, if you want to grow tomatoes, you can grow the uh, the what do you call them? The determinate type, the bush type, or you can grow the vine type because commercial operations of uh, tomato production they grow, uh, they grow the tomato for six or nine months. So those definitely are the vine uh, type uh, tomato plants. And here are two different kinds of uh, lettuces, and here are the patio tomato. Those are the new tomato. I don't know if you've heard of them. That they are naturally dwarf. They don't get too big. Supposedly no more than six inches tall, but my system is feeding them on on steroids, so they got to be like a foot and a half tall and three foot wide and all kind of basil, uh, basil, all kind of plants you can grow because you have um, some physical support that you can carry the weight of that tomato plant instead of that foam board uh, uh, floating on water. 
and here's more basil and here's uh, garlic chives that I've grown and here's cucumber and uh, the, this leaf is big uh, that it's bigger than, than my palm, you know, like almost two palm. That's how big they were. And you know that they were very well fed because each flower cluster uh, had, uh, you know, like five, six uh, flower in one spot. Um, of course, I they, they I did not plant the Parthenocarpic cucumber, which Parthenocarpic means they uh, don't need pollination to set. I planted regular varieties, was so just for pictures. So out of those five flowers, uh, very few set because they did not get pollinated. Uh, but so if you do want to grow a cucumber, get the Parthenocarpic. Uh, and I can type that in the chat box for you. Uh, 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 you know, seedless cucumber, I think they're called also. Uh, tomato pepper is not an issue to grow in a greenhouse because they're self pollinated. Uh, they don't need bumblebees or uh, extra outside pollination to set. OK. And uh, here's Epcot Park. Epcot, so we went to Disney and Epcot, we took some pictures and basically this is hydroponic. Why? Because this uh, square cube is a jiffy a compressed peat block and uh, that is sitting in a bag of peat or perlite and it's being drip irrigation and then the excess water goes out. So very little uh, volume used, but they can grow beautiful cucumbers and beautiful vegetables. So this is hydroponic because it fits the definition. No soil, soilless media in a control environment, even though it's not water. Here on this side, you see they have the NFT system because you see the slope and you see the channels. So that is the true, like I said, the true understanding the average person when they hear hydroponic, they think water. But this is also hydroponic based on the definition. And we, you know, Texas State Fair, uh, again, I showed you a picture where they grow on tomatoes. Here they grow on cucumbers. Dutch bucket is more versatile. They don't have to be on on uh, on a bench. Uh, mine are sitting on the floor. That is not an issue. But what the issue is that when a rat or a roof rat uh, got inside my greenhouse in the fall and uh, chewed up all my plants. So make sure you take care of that. OK, substrate culture for cherry tomato, meaning that inside here, uh, there are uh, the media and the plants are here, but but then they are the stem is growing and then they are supported with the stakes here. So a little bit uh, outside. So the, this L is elevated uh, and then the stem goes down and then the, the stakes are in the ground to gain that extra length uh, and extra height instead of uh, this being elevated and then the, as the plants get taller. Uh, here, all these are on the ground level and so beautiful uh, cherry tomatoes. The only difference between uh, really uh, when if you're growing uh, tomato versus lettuce is the uh, recipe, uh, the chemical recipe of the fertilizer solution. You cannot use the same fertilizer solution for um, Lettuce, for example, briefly on nutrients. Lettuce, the same nutrient solution year round. Tomato, what you use uh, at the vegetative stage when they're still growing is different than what you use when they start flowering and even different than what you use when they are starting to harvest. OK, um, um, that alone nutrient nutrition can be a whole subject uh, and if you like, we can have an hour long uh, presentation in the future on nutrition. Uh, this is a beautiful operation. What do you see here? Well, they used uh, cinder, blo uh, cinder block. No, not cinder block. Uh, come on. They use these. I'm getting a senile moment to make the wall and the media is in between here. So they are planted in between. So basically like a raised bed filled with media and there's two lines of tomatoes and then two lines of drip irrigation. Because this is media, uh, not soil, and because it's in a greenhouse, that fits the description. You can easily call this a hydroponic tomato and sell it as hydroponic tomato. Okay, remember, it's the definition. And 
All right, and here is even a, an, a, another uh, way of growing it. Uh, it's media, but uh, so the uh, strawberry is in media, but they are watered uh, with a recirculating water. Water nutrient comes here, comes out at the end and goes back to the tank. Strawberry is the only one crop that I know that will not do well uh, in a deep water culture. It does not like sitting in water, no matter how much air you pump into that water. So it needs some media and then you water it just like you are water growing them in the field. And you can go vertical as long as the rows are not on top of each other so they don't shade on so they don't shade each other. Um, University of Arizona, uh, if you look up University of Arizona has done a lot of research on growing strawberry, uh, go to them if you'd like to see, uh, learn more about strawberry production. And here is a combination of substrate and deep flow technique because the strawberry plants are sitting in that media, in that uh, potting mix, you know, uh, but that pot is sitting in that square hole I mean, again, this is a three by three uh, pot, so plenty of media, plenty of root, but that is sitting in uh, water, deep water culture that's flowing from one end to the other. OK, so again, once you learn and see the needs and how they work, you can grow it uh, anywhere you like. Uh, and again, that water can be um, uh, on a timer or can be permanent uh, flowing so that there's always uh, like an inch of water at the bottom. All right, we've gone through deep water culture. We've gone through uh, the pond, uh, the NFT system. Next one is the vertical tower where the concept is to use the vertical space. OK, you can uh, example if you search online, you can search what we call tower gardens, grow rack, uh, each one. They are different. Tower, uh, tower garden is vertical, grow rack, it's horizontal shelves, but multiple shelves on top of each other. OK, so the tower garden more for hobbyist and homeowner, but I'll show you how you can make it as a commercial operation. You need reservoir, uh, reservoir needs replenishing regularly. Uh, grow time is slower, but you have very high density per square foot. I'll show you what I mean. Lighting can be tricky. I'll, I'll show you. I guess uh, let's not read this. I'll show you a picture of what I mean. But they are very versatile system for an individual uh, or a hobby. You have one system. Uh, grow rack, on the other hand, uh, they are, uh, imagine a bench and multiple benches on top of each other, but because they're on top of each other, then you definitely need light for each shelf to, uh, otherwise it will not work. Okay, so this is the um, uh, vertical towers and this is the concept of it, you know, a reservoir and the pump that drops a nutrient solution on top. And then there's some kind of foam or rubber or some kind of mesh netting, whatever, to hold the plants and allow the water to percolate slowly at the same time, wetting the roots of the plant. And then at the end, it goes back to the reservoir. So Zip Grow, Zip Grow, uh, one word, Zip Grow is a company that sells this kit, uh, or they can sell you uh, like a full system that can fill a whole greenhouse. OK, that is the concept and and you can add light because um, you can see here they can shade uh, one. This can shade this one if early morning, uh, etc. or late in the afternoon, they can shade each other. But if you have a uh, commercial inside the warehouse, commercial operation, then you can buy a light kit. Uh, then this way you have light uh, and uh, the, the shading is not an issue. OK, so here's the name of the company. You can look them up. Uh, OK, I'm not saying they are the best. This is one of the companies that uh, is selling. We don't endorse anybody. OK, uh, versus a uh, uh, here's another example of a vertical tower and sometimes they are a one PVC tube or that PV uh, that is wide enough that you can have eight plants uh, per circle. OK, and I bought one, two of them actually, one with lights and one without lights. 
But what I didn't like about it is that the reservoir at the bottom is only like enough for three gallon. That's what I didn't like. So by the time uh, water disappears, you go next day and the plants are wilted. Uh, so uh, and because it's running all the time, so there's lots of water agitation opportunity for water to evaporate. Uh, so that three gallon does not last as long. So uh, what when life gives you lemon, what do you do? You make lemonade. So I drilled the hole in the bottom of that tank and I, you know, some cinder blocks and some frame and whatever. And, I, and now the pump that used to be here now is in that big 45 gallon reservoir tank. And now that tower is sitting on that frame, which is uh, sitting over that res big reservoir, 45 gallon of nutrient solution instead of three gallon. So the pump pumps it to the top, it percolates to the bottom, and it goes back through the hole that I drilled, goes down to that tank. Okay? Life gives you lemon, make lemonade. And here are my two systems, uh, this one without light, and the one next to it here with light. And this video here is a time lapse, one picture taken uh, at the same time, time of the day we compile them together to show you this is like three weeks uh, two and a half weeks three weeks uh, in three seconds okay uh, and this system is with the lights and actually look here look at this corner here you see even the nft system look how fast they are growing you see that so focus on circling with my laser pointer so in in two three weeks uh, you can harvest and they're ready to go. And we planted four different types of uh, lettuce varieties, and they all did fine, no problem at all. Okay, now this is I mentioned that these are best suited for a hobbyist system because you they need attention care because of the small uh, 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 reservoir but it can be made as a commercial operation like you see in this picture they by modifying the uh, supply. I put it on top of res 45 gallon reservoir here. They have an inlet. You see this tubing here. This is the this is the inlet water that pushes the water to the tops and it circulates and then when it comes out it drains from the reservoir into that uh, two inch PVC to the line to go back. So it is recirculating and then it can be made as a commercial operation or you do the same. Even if you have one system, you need to work and be concerned that uh, one uh, just that three gallon reservoir, you have to check it every day. OK, and it's not easy to refill because you have to refill it from the top. OK, so need a ladder and need the galley that one gallon at a time and make a mess and uh, you know it's it's messy. OK, so um, vertical tower uh, take not vertical, taking advantage of vertical space. You can build an A frame, uh, then your channels, the NFT channels instead of being horizontal. Now they are on an A frame so that this one is not the shading this one not nothing is being shaded well maybe here in between but looks like they're getting plenty of light and he, uh, so so an a frame um, whether it's you put media or whether it's nft or whether it's deep water culture uh, all of that remember once you know how they work it doesn't matter now you are taking the same systems that they were horizontal now you're taking them and going vertically to take advantage of uh, the vertical space that you have and here's even more uh, systems where uh, this is definitely recirculating when you see these here water starts on the pores on the top and water recirculates and then goes back to reservoir tank uh, all kinds of pots uh, on top of each other take advantage of vertical space. You see all kind of crops from uh, Swiss chard to leafy greens to red Swiss chard or maybe this is um, uh, red amaranth uh, possibly. OK, uh, to something beautiful, 
you know, instead of you see how these uh, PVC is recirculating. I mean, this is this is cosmetic. This is beautiful to attract, not really, um, not uh, to make uh, will make you extra money. This is Epcot uh, in May 2010, and they're growing these pumpkins that are hanging in the air. Make sure you support it with a net so it doesn't fall from its own weight. Uh, but the base of the plant is here. You see the uh, here are the the plants are here and the vine is growing and they're spreading and they train them and so it's again it's hydroponic because they're not growing in soil and they are growing in a um, controlled environment and here is a uh, again um, uh, I would I think this is aeroponic where they are misting them on the inside. Uh, so they have to be well sealed and uh, so this is the foam board instead of uh, horizontal now it's angled in that a frame and they closed all the holes so if there's no plant you plug it so and then you mist it uh, with the water from the inside and you grow the best uh, bok choy again once you if you're a handyman if you have uh, creative ideas once you know what is required and all the components and you can make the delivery uh, of the nutrient solution to the plant in an efficient way, you can build it any way you like. Even if they are bureau, these vertical towers, uh, pots like that. Uh, I mean, this is really more pretty than commercially uh, uh, sustainable. Um, Eden Green in Cleburne, which is southwest of Fort Worth, is a new type of operation and we're going to have a tour and we've been there many times. They have these uh, tubing that are 20 foot tall, but they also have um, a control environment at the plant level because they're pumping air. In, uh, you see this PVC here that's pumping air uh, to, so that that tube on the inside does not warm up. So even the inside of that, uh, I mean, think of it as a four inch PVC pipe, four inch PVC pipe with the plants there and the water is dripping on the inside, but they're also pumping air, cooled air, so they uh, there's no warmer hot spot and cool spots and, and, and all that. And then they also added uh, 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 light bars that moves up and down, uh, so th because it's 20 foot tall, you can imagine that this is shading that, and they had that issue. Uh, so they fixed it by building their own uh, light, moving light bar, that uh, LED light, uh, moving LED. And uh, we did the math, they're like 50 times more efficient in terms of space, uh, in terms of going up in height and cycles per year. One acre is equivalent to 50 acres in the field. A grow rack, uh, a vertical tower and grow rack is the other one system that uses uh, the vertical space. Um, but now we are talking about shelves that are stacked on top of each other. OK, that, that means each shelf must have its own light uh, to uh, otherwise they'll absolutely be shaded. OK, and they can be grown anywhere. So here is a kit that we have with four shelves. Each one has its own light, has a fan and uh, water circulating. So the water pump to the top and drains to the next one and then uh, drains to the next one and then drains to the next one and goes back to the solution tank. On a timer, light on a timer, uh, there are companies that have 20 of these shelves on top of each other and imagine a whole Walmart size uh, warehouse full of these shelves. You imagine the productivity. And uh, here is um, the um, kit sold by Bootstrap Farmer, again with all the parts and supplies necessary to grow. They're popular to grow uh, microgreens, they're popular to grow anything you want really because you have everything here in one place. Lights, temperature, fan, uh, you know, uh, nutrient solution, all that. OK. And here's another company uh, that uh, specialize in microgreens. Um, now uh, here, even though, um, your eyes see it as red color, but it's a combination of red and blue. OK, um, and there's a lot of research on 
what plants like more red than blue and what plants like more uh, blue than red uh, to, to give you the best nutrients or best flavor or, or highest yield. Uh, of course, the shelving can be like the one that we have at our system can be used as a flood and drain or ebb and flow. If you ever heard of flood and drain system is the same thing as ebb and flow because the pump floods it, uh, floods it here and then the pump shuts down and then it drains back to the reservoir. So you have pots then they sit in the pot, the pot uh, it gets uh, sits, uh, gets soaked up in the water and the plant soak up uh, the media, soaks up the nutrient solution and they are wetted. So this is very popular nurseries because you have pots instead of having to water by hand 1000 or 10,000 pots, you have a system like this and then it's automatic and they're all watered automatically. Um, at the same time. So here is the small tip that we have. It's not turned on in this picture, but here's the pump here. I mean, the, here's the pump that pumps the water and the pots are sitting here. When we fill it, do you see that white line here? That's white stain here and here. That is the level of water that goes up, reaches maximum after three minutes. Uh, and that gives it enough time for the pots to soak up enough nutrients. And then when it pump shuts down, that water drains back down to the tank and then we have it every hour uh, running for three minutes or every two hours initially and as the plant gets bigger uh, switch down to uh, hour uh, every hour on for three minutes to water the plants. And uh, this is a top view showing you the intake and then the drainage. Uh, a drainage uh, back uh, and here's the pump one to fill and the other hose to drain back into the into the reservoir tank. All right, the last system I think I'm going to talk about is aeroponic and here is the concept. Instead of the pots sitting on the foam board with the net cup sitting in water, whether the water is static or whether the water is moving, now the uh, the pot uh, is uh, and the air are sitting in the air. You see here sitting in the air and they are being misted missed it from the inside with a nutrient solution and as the plants grow the roots are hanging in the air uh, and they uh, get uh, their nutrient uh, uh, you know delivered to them with the mist. OK, so it's on a timer, not 24 hours a day on a timer every hour for five minutes. Miss them. Uh, uh, and this is the system that we have. Uh, this is in between crops. Um, so again, you know, this shelf uh, with the lights uh, above it and this shelf has its own light and it has a fan uh, and here's the reservoir and you open the zipper and then you see the mist and actually let me show you here is the, the zipper from the side when you open here's the tubing inside with the nozzles that will mist them. It's a great way and NASA loves the system and they've done a lot of research but that's what they have uh, done the research at the space station and thinking maybe on the trips to Mars they need something like this because it's very minimum volume of water used because water weight is heavy you know one one gallon weighs eight pounds uh, so that's a lot of water and it's recirculating and you can grow uh, big crops uh, like potato can grow there potato uh, you can grow in an aeroponic system and you open the zipper harvest uh, the potato that's big enough and leave the rest uh, to continue growing so you can have the same potato growing for years on end because you just open the zipper harvest the one or uh, the mature one and leave the plants to continue remember potato is not an annual it can, can like pepper they continue to grow uh, here they are annual for us because they uh, the uh, weather kills them. Not all varieties of potato. OK, so which system to choose? If you want to focus on leafy greens and herbs, herbs, then NFT or deep water culture uh, is your choice. For long term crops like fruiting vegetables, tomato, pepper, beans, melon, cucumbers, then you need the, the Dutch bucket. You need some kind of soil substrate that can be combined with uh, water flowing or drip irrigation or whatever. I've seen you pictures of all those, but um, 
um, keep, keep this uh, picture in mind. All right. Now, this next big problem we have with uh, with um, um, production is, uh, especially in the hot uh, cl southern climate there we are in, is keeping the uh, climate uh, cool. Some high tech greenhouses are using air condition, uh, but uh, most people use uh, what we call evaporative cooling pad or wet wall. Oh, sorry, this should be two L's. Wet wall. OK, wet wall, meaning this wall is this is uh, let me see this material here like a sponge and is being wetted drip uh, wetted here. So and on the other end of the greenhouse, like here in this picture here on the right, I'm standing next to the fan behind me and here's the wet wall on the other end. So the fan blow the air to the outside and that will uh, uh, the uh, blow the air to the outside and that will suck air in. The air goes through the wet wall and you know evaporation is a cooling process. So the evaporation of the water uh, moves that moist cool water and will cool the greenhouse um, um, with that cool wet mist that is generated by the water uh, air moving through the wet wall and evaporating the cool water. But again, that's not very efficient because uh, if that here is 100 feet, then by the time that cool mist reaches halfway, it's already warm. So it's not very efficient and that's a limitation of uh, our greenhouses in the south. Uh, and that's why we say the fan should be close to the wet wall as much as possible. So if you have 30 by 96, Ideally, it's better put the wet wall uh, on the 96 on the long end and you know the fan on the other end. So this way there's only 30 foot distance, but that means more expense, more wet wall and more fans instead of where traditionally they are put on the short end, you know, wet wall on the 30 foot end and the fans on the other 30 foot end that is 96 uh, foot apart. So if you can afford it, put the fans on the wet wall on the 96 foot length. This way there's only 30 feet length in between them. OK, so now there is a, re a concept and we've tried it. Instead of cooling the whole greenhouse, why don't we uh, cool the uh, nutrient solution where the roots are, what we call root zone? Why don't we cool the root zone instead of cooling the whole greenhouse and we've done the research and we found that cooling the root zone improved the yield in tomato, <clears throat> improved the quality in amaranth and improved the survival rate in spinach. So let me quickly show you this picture. This picture was done with research where we, uh, you know, uh, how uh, uh, how long we cool the root zone and at what temperature. So for example, this leaf here sat in uh, in water that's 20 degrees C uh, for one day or three days or five days or seven days. Of course, the control is about 25, 26 degrees C, so warmer. So uh, so what what do you if if more red is ideal, so let's say this is ideal, then you need five degrees C for five days. If your temperature is 10 degrees C, then you need seven days to get that ideal. If your water temperature is 15, you'll never get that or warmer. You'll never get that ideal fully red amaranth to get you the highest price. So the colder, the water temperature, uh, nutrient zone temperature where the roots are, uh, the faster you get that full coloration uh, than, uh, than at warmer temperature. That's what this whole slide is. So that's the quality. In terms of survival, here is the study where we've grown all kind of crop, water spinach, two kinds of spinach, two bok choy, two kind of bok choy, two kind of lettuces. And this is uh, chilled to 74 and this is controlled. So that was like 89. OK, and uh, impaired. Uh, this is where the spinach is. Um, 
and uh, you see here um, week. Oh, so this is two weeks later. Sorry, this is week after one week later. You see the spinach uh, in the warmer water. They not like it. They are barely surviving, and most of them dead compared to the chilled 74. And then two weeks later, all of them survived. I mean, not ideal, uh, but versus uh, most of them dead. But the other crops, lettuce didn't care, bok choy didn't care, water spinach. Actually, this is a, a tropical crop. Tropical crop, uh, water spinach. Uh, it's not spinach. It's called water spinach, but it's not spinach. This one hated the cold water. Uh, see, it was growing poorer when the water was chilled because it's from the tropics. Again, it's not a spinach variety. It's called water spinach. Um, okay. Uh, so that is the effect on survival. You saw with the amaranth the benefit of chilling the temperature on quality. OK, I've shown you the Eden Green photos. Here's a close up where the uh, air temperature is pumped here so that these plants have also constant temperature, not not only constant uh, supply of uh, nutrients. But look at that beautiful uh, size plants all the way to the top. OK. Um, here is our system growing lettuce in the middle of summer. We can easily get tip burn. You see here this is tip burn. Look it up. I don't have time to discuss in detail or starting to bolt. You see the stem how starting to elongate. So uh, how to avoid potential issues? First, always start with the right variety. OK, just like spinach in Japan, choose the right variety that says tip burn resistant, uh, bolting resistant and also harvest at early stages or, or or switch instead of head lettuce, switch to a variety that's a leaf lettuce. This way you cut individual leaves, even if it bolted you, the leaf lettuce, individual leaves are still marketable uh, instead of uh, head lettuce that bolted and it's uh, garbage. You're not going to be able to sell it. But most importantly, get an airflow fan like this, which is about $80. Well, then maybe now it's $150. Uh, and I told the grower to add it and see this foam here. The, the foam ends here, but this plant is part of this foam. OK, this was before he added uh, the fan and you see the edges of uh, you see the edges here. You follow my laser point. You see how the uh, uh, diseased uh, and uh, you know dead points versus after he put the plant. Uh, sorry, after he put the fan, there is no tip burn on the edge of any of these plants. I was a king to that guy because of that. It cost him more than one fan and they are expensive, but none of them uh, were, uh, you know, all of them were marketable and he could sell uh, uh, the, everything. OK. When to harvest baby greens, this is the size of baby greens. Now there's the restaurateurs or the buyers tell you all oh, we want teen greens. They're not baby greens, but they're not mature plants. They're in between, so we call them teen. Uh, so uh, that is uh, again. So if you're growing a full head lettuce, you choose a different variety than if you're choosing teen or baby greens um, uh, for for that. And and with lettuces, there are lots of options available or mixed greens are uh, will go well and you can plant them together. So when you cut, you have mixed salad. Uh, ready for sale at the same time. It does not have to be one. I know people that plant red and green lettuce together in the same cell. So when they're harvest, it's a mixed salad together at the same at, at one time. OK, um, let's see if we can cover the nutrient solution in the next five minutes. Again, this is not a encyclopedia, a comprehensive class on everything uh, enough to get you started. So for nutrient solution, if you want to be a commercial grower, you have to spend the money to get a dosing system, the quality uh, sensing system with a dosing that it could measure it every five minutes. And if it needs adjustments, it will adjust it automatically. Uh, because then you can get 100% uh, Usain Bolt running speed that you can finish the in in Olympic uh, 
like uh, what are you, uh, winning a time. OK, you don't want to use you want to measure it yourself daily, uh, adjusting it once a day versus adjusting it every five minutes. You're not going to have Olympic uh, winning time. You're going to have a, I don't know, high school race winning time. You understand the analogy? I hope you understand the, the analogy. You will grow. They will succeed. They, you will harvest. You will sell, but not 100%, maybe 90%. And that 10% sometimes can make a difference between winning and, and losing money. Okay? So that is my advantage, uh, but as a hobbyist or as a beginner or a small greenhouse, if you measure daily and adjust daily, uh, they will grow. They will be fine, um, just not optimal. OK, there are lots of recipes. Uh, here's the Cornell recipe for lettuce. Here's the Cornell uh, by Dr. Neil Matson, who modified it for his research. University of Arizona, Sonfeld solution, Sonfeld and Straver solution. And here is how much, uh, you know, parts per million you need for all the uh, elements. So you mix them, you know, you mix them and, uh, and, uh, and uh, you know you make you you can mix your own recipe you don't have to buy you can buy the elements and then mix your own uh, recipe uh, to meet what you want uh, notice that uh, some of them here uh, uh, these two uh, don't have any sulfur and look what happens when you don't have any sulfur uh, for example, uh, my colleague Dr. Zen on main campus used this uh, Jax fertilizer 12416, uh, did not have sulfur. And look here what happened uh, to the basal without the sulfur. She added magnesium sulfate and look the same. Look how poof, from trash to uh, to a crop that uh, you, you can sell. OK, so. Um, you know, I mean, that's not normal. OK, something tells you that now. I mean, that's not nitrogen. That's not iron. I mean, I would have thought maybe magnesium, but uh, what do I know? It's ended up being sulfate. So um, uh, I suggest you start as a as a beginner, start with a commercial recipe uh, and then with time uh, switch to making your own recipe because then you can save time and money. OK, but uh, Let's start here because this is the video and let's come back in five minutes. How about that? Dr. Masabni, do you have time for any questions? I have, uh, yes, it's 10.59. We can answer some questions, please. OK, um, so one of the questions we had a while back was about different soil medias. So this person's question was, what kind of media is used for the tomatoes that look like they were growing in the ground? Eat or any peat, uh, co uh, peat, coconut core, perlite, or any of those combination, or whatever is cheaper for you. Uh, definitely not sand that uh, weighs heavy, definitely not soil. Uh, that can come with all kind of weeds and diseases. So peat, coconut core, perlite, or any of those combination uh, will work. Either alone, or mixtures that you hey find the mixture was holding. I mean, we know uh, coconut core plus perlite uh, plus peat uh, is better combination than either one alone. You know, a good drainage, good good nutrient water holding capacity, better than either one alone. So, okay, thank you. Do you have time for one more, or should we go to Please. break? Yeah, please go ahead. OK, um, so another question that we had was what are the advantages and the disadvantages of a tower system versus a horizontal NFT system? Uh, the tower system, you gain uh, vertical space. So if you have uh, a frame, uh, not only you have the square footage, but uh, multiplied by height. That's the only uh, initial cost is higher because you have more infrastructure to build the frame and to build all that. But with time, if you want to sell, with time uh, you are growing more crop per square foot. Uh, disadvantage, like I said, uh, the initial cost with uh, going vertically is uh, is initially is higher. But once you recoup your cost, then it's a pure profit. OK, thank you very much. Uh, 
Brandy and Shannon. All right, let's watch this video on. Uh, how do how do I start it? There we go. Have you ever heard of uh, parts per million and fertilizer recipes, and and wondered how to calculate how much to mix to get that parts per million? Well, here is the formula you need to remember. Ounce per gallon, ounce of fertilizer per gallon is equal to the desired parts per million that you want, multiplied by the dilution factor if you are using an injector. I'll show you what I mean. 75 is a constant, and percent N is the uh, nitrogen in the fertilizer you are using. So let's say you are using 20, 20, 20. You put 20 here, not 0.2. You're using 15 or triple 13. You put 13 here. Okay, so let's say I want 100 parts per million to fertilize uh, my uh, lettuce seedlings, and I'm not using an injector. So it's a direct mix and, and use. So the dilution factor is one. So 75 is a constant, and I'm using uh, greenhouse grade fertilizer, so that's 20, 20, 20. So the percent of nitrogen is 20. 100 divided by 75 divided by 20 is 0.067 ounce per gallon. So I add 0.06 ounce, 0.067 ounce per gallon, and I can use it directly to fertilize my seedlings, my plants, anywhere I want. You can put it in your uh, garden, water the garden with it, whatever. Let's say I am using an injector, and it is set at 100 times dilution, then that DF becomes one, so it's uh, 100. So instead of one, you put 100 here, everything else is the same. Now you need to add 6.7 ounces per gallon. If you mix 6.7 ounces per gallon, do not use that solution directly on the plant. That solution is 100 times concentrated. So you have to use it in a bucket that is uh, being used with an injector like this that dilutes it. So this is a Dosetron brand. There's many brands available. Works with the water flow. It doesn't need any electricity. And right now it is set at 128. So there's 100, there's 64, there's 50, whatever you like. The higher the number, the more volume you can dilute it. Or another word of saying it, that this five gallon at a dilution of 100 is equal to 500 gallon of usable solution. That diluted, ready to use. At 128, this five gallon now is 680 gallon or something like that, okay? So this is a great opportunity and I've shown you some videos of my garden where I have one of these. Uh, this way I can travel, I can leave, and I know that my garden is... That uh, 128 is a uh, 640 gallon, not 680. I was, uh, pick, uh, shoot, you know, trying to do mental math quick and I got the wrong number. But anyway, you understand the concept. Uh, fertilizer uh, uh, injectors are, again, a necessary part of your um, uh, operation uh, if you are a commercial uh, you know, operation. Even as a hobby or as a beginner, like I said, anything that you can automate, uh, then you can focus on the true on the true issues of the production, which are pest and disease control, um, P -E -P -P pH, EC adjustments, buying, selling. Uh, that's uh, what you need to focus on, not uh, uh, fertilizing and watering by hand. OK, <clears throat> so. Um, there are uh, lots of options available. There's, uh, we are lucky to have more and more organic options uh, in terms of fertilizer. Uh, 10 years ago, there were no organic uh, fertilizer used in a hydroponic operation, but now we have more and more like preempt and Kimitec uh, brands are uh, organic uh, fertilizer used in a hydroponic operation. Okay, pH gradient. 
um, I mentioned many times pH is important uh, and uh, you have the automatic adjustments and automatic machine that measures and adjusts uh, to keep that nutrient solution as a for a commercial. Remember, you need to have 100 percent efficiency and 100 uh, percent growth rate. But I did a small study to show what would happen to plants grown at different pHs. So these are four spinach plants grown at pH three, uh, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine and then if I take one plant oops if I take one plant of each and put them next to each other three four five six seven eight nine you'll see in terms of top growth really starting uh, at six six to nine and uh, very little difference six to nine uh, at five, maybe 10 to 15 percent less, but really the visible uh, problem is with the root uh, death. But four, both top and bottom here at three, the plant barely surviving. All right, so as a hobbyist, uh, uh, do, do not obsess with the, your pH solution if it if it's not exactly 6.2 or 5.6, depending on what the fertilizer requires. OK, because seven or eight will be fine. So what if it's 10% uh, less total yield? You are a hobbyist. This is for home consumption, not for sale. But if you want to sell and every ounce is money, then you need to be in the ideal range. OK, that's the purpose of all this uh, study. Media that goes back to the question we had a little earlier. Cocoa, coconut core has great water retention. Rock wool is uh, like a Grodan brand is artificial. Excellent water retention. Expanded clay pellets. They're neutral, reusable, great for flood and drain system. A combination of clay pellet and cocoa core is better than clay pellets alone. Uh, is expensive and of course you have the perlite. So here are your four options in terms of media. Of course, the fifth option is just water, water solution. Um, and we have all of them in uh, different combinations. So here's Ella pot, E-L-L-A P-O-T, Ella pot that comes in a package, like a small uh, package, uh, looks like potting mix and perlite uh, wrapped together so you don't you don't have to fill the pellets. You, you wet them and you start using them. Jiffy pellets and we had CBOP, which is like coconut fiber uh, wrapped in a bag uh, and you have the rock wool. OK, the rock wool, uh, the Grodan brand, uh, you know, um, all of them, have you noticed, all of them have that little dip in the hole that you can drop the seeds so instant and they and they fit in the tray. So they're very user friendly. The only difference between these four is the water retention uh, like this one because it's fiber. Uh, drained a lot faster, so it's better suited for some plants, uh, a variety, not others. So when we grew them for uh, over like uh, two weeks and we looked at the germination of the seedlings um, and we put them together, and this is uh, how the same plants of the same age uh, look. Sea uh, bob, the coconut fiber, drained very well. So if you want to use it with lettuce, you have to water it more often than if you are using these two. Because look what happened, watering them at the same time, yeah, the same amount, uh, they, they drained, so they dried out faster. Jiffy was the next one that dried out, whereas Elopot and the rock wool uh, held had most water retention and had the biggest seedling uh, with seedling size. Of course, these are fine and they survive and you can transplant them. They will do fine. It's just that uh, just showing you the differences in water retention and uh, quality. So this may be this CBOP. I would use it maybe for cuttings where you don't want it to be wet too long. You want that stem uh, flower cutting or whatever to vegetable cutting to uh, to have more drainage so it doesn't rot. Uh, so that will be suited for that. Uh, that versus rock wool, which is better suited for uh, seeds and seedlings. OK. 
uh, net cups. This is what, uh, what I've been mentioning, net cups. I've been mentioning cut your own foam. And like I said, if you want to cut it with a circular saw, cut it backward, let it spin backward, it'll make less mess and it'll make a cleaner edge. Uh, we tried it putting the potting mix directly. We tried putting the potting mix uh, using like a napkin first so that it doesn't fall out. We didn't see any difference, uh, any, very little falls out even if it's because there's very little agitation and they, and they did fine. So we, we, grew, we grew it like this and, um, and they both did fine. Um, something new to the market that will replace the net cups, that will replace Grodana, will replace everything is are this, uh, uh, what do you call them, foam pieces that are flexible. See, if you, squeeze, if you squeeze here, it will open and you put the seedling in there. And, and this way, if uh, let me go back, if you put uh, that uh, grow grip will fit perfectly in this size. Uh, and as long as the root comes uh, is visible and is touching the water at the bottom, uh, it will grow well. With that grow grip, you don't need media. You don't need the grow dan. You don't need any of those uh, media or and you don't need the uh, uh, net cups because that goes directly in the hole. You just have to find a way of growing seedlings uh, and you, when you, uh, so what I use is I grow loose rock wool. I bought loose rock wool, which is like similar to the insulation material. And I spread the seeds on top of that loose rock wool. And then when the seedling germinated, I took a bunch, shook them in water that loosened the loose rock wool uh, from the roots. And then I was able to separate each seedling uh, separately, bare root seedling. And then I, I put the seedling here with the bottom sticking out, put it in that hole and, um, and it did very well. I loved it. And these are recyclable. Sometimes this got deformed because the stem uh, warped it and it do does not close. So if you're lucky, you can get two or three cycles out of it. But otherwise, uh, they are cheap. What's more, you search online for the grow grip and you see a lot, I've seen a lot of people making them their own. Uh, so you get a round foam and you cut a slit on the side and you can use that. So you can make your own from fl that flexible foam that uh, you can make a slit in it and you and use it that way. Um, like I said, once you know what works and what is needed, you can make it work your way, uh, your own way. Um, so Grow Grip is the brand. I've seen them on Amazon. You can buy like a bag of uh, 25 Grow Grips. I, I, I don't want to quote the price because that was from three years ago. I'm sure it's gone up a lot. Um, here are some of the miscellaneous crop we've grown uh, over time. Uh, here is uh, chives uh, and basil in the uh, uh, Dutch bucket. Um, what is this here? Uh, basil, different kinds of basil in the NFT. Uh, the, again, different kinds of basil in the NFT. This is a uh, another type of hydroponic system where I'm growing a pepper in it. Basically, this is a five gallon bucket. I fill it with nutrient solution and it has, imagine a huge net cup. I mean, the lid is like a lid with a net cup in it and you put the seedling in there, you put an air pump and the plant will grow. So this is like deep water culture, but in a five gallon bucket. The, the, very nice. The, the, uh, so you just have to buy the lid, that specialty uh, part, the five gallon bucket get anywhere. And they, But you definitely need air pump because it's static water. It will, uh, the, the big plants like lettuce, uh, will uh, not do well like, uh, sorry, big plant like pepper will not do as well as lettuce and static water without an air pump. And here's again our Dutch buckets uh, with the different kind of basils and I mean we, we, we've grown everything. Whatever you say, I've grown rhubarb, I've grown ginger, I've grown turmeric. Uh, I don't have, I'm not showing you the pictures here, but um, when you supply everything the plant needs, uh, fertilizer, timer, air, uh, nutrient solution, all this, uh, the plants will grow. Uh, here's a different kind of basil, lime basil. I even grown mint in the NFT. 
mint, you know, makes runners, those uh, underground runners everywhere. So once in a while we had to open the lid of the NFT channel and cut off the runners and give the roots a haircut uh, kind of to rejuvenate and encourage new growth. To, I was able to grow mint for a whole year uh, in an, an NFT uh, channel. Here is the cucumber. I think you've seen this picture before. This is how big the leaf was. And look at here, four or five flowers uh, per cluster. I, I wish uh, I should have planted. And these are growing in those uh, five gallon uh, bucket. OK, look at how many flowers. But again, uh, these uh, cucumbers are grown in the uh, Dutch buckets. Of course, my mistake, I did not chose the Parthenocarpic uh, cucumber, so many of these aborted because they did not get pollinated. And here's the mint. Uh, and again, they were six inches apart, so we found the trick that uh, harvest every other one uh, so that uh, they don't crowd each other. Uh, OK, and then you harvest it. Uh, of course, uh, in a greenhouse, I'm not going to go into too much uh, issues of insect and pest control because that alone can be a whole day. But in a greenhouse operation, your biggest concerns in terms of insects are your aphids and your white flies. Uh, OK, those are your biggest concerns. Uh, and you, they will, it's like they come with the uh, NFT channel. And here's the mint and here's opening the the uh, lid cover and cutting this white uh, root. That's the rhizome and and giving the roots a haircut to encourage new roots to grow. See, here's old roots, here's new roots uh, growing. And uh, that was the best mint ever because year round is was tender and uh, not tough. Uh, you know, uh, spearmint uh, always ready to eat instead of tough uh, and, you know, too strong of a bite flavor. Um, and here is the spinach with its root system. I've had Swiss chard um, and uh, and kale that were so huge. Uh, they I couldn't remove them because the stem was bigger than that one inch square hole. Um, and here's all kind of lettuces, all kind of tomatoes we were growing. It's a, it's a, I mean, it's really a pleasure growing in a hydroponic system, even though, like I said, lettuce tasted a little bit funny, uh, more bland. Uh, uh, and over the winter and the spring, they had more flavor. I guess they had more light. Otherwise, I call it uh, crunchy water. And here is the uh, kale and kellet and, uh, and Swiss chard and uh, um, yeah, lots of plant. Here's the Swiss chard. See how it's so big that it, you couldn't remove it. I wanted to take it out and put it in the garden. It was so I had to cut it with a razor blade and put it in water for a few days to encourage new roots to grow and then took that and planted and uh, took it, pl planted it uh, for a year in the garden. My Swiss chard and my uh, kale they were into and you if you watch my YouTube channel. You can see the videos on that. So and I've grew rhubarb. Here's uh, Victoria Red, uh, and uh, here is the rhubarb in the fall. Planted them, and uh, by June of next year, they were overripe. It got too hot, and they started to wilt. So you can grow rhubarb in Texas as a winter crop. Plant at the same time you plant your uh, garlic, whether outside in the garden or in your hydroponic system, and then take it out in June when you harvest your garlic. Uh, and start from seed. Don't buy roots. Start from seed and you can have rhubarb and this is the kale uh, and here is mustard green. Oh, I mean, if you love your vegetables um, and you have a small system, 48 plants, different crops, each channel a different crop or a combination of crops, something you can cut. It's like this mustard green, your kale, your Swiss chard is cut and grow. I mean, you have 10 plants. Even if you take one leaf from each plant, that's a meal. So you don't need a lot of plants if you if you want to eat healthy and grow your own plants. And here's kale and kellet growing the Dutch buckets. Uh, in, in terms of pest management, here's the aphids. When you see wrinkling on the leaves like this, look on the bottom side, you'll see something sucking on the foliage and that's aphids. Uh, and or wrinkled leaves like this it could be aphids, could be thrips. Uh, what I use is my own recipe of insecticidal soap. So here is the soap, the cheapest hand soap. 
and I use two teaspoons in one and a half gallon or four teaspoons in my, if you have a three gallon sprayer and the olive oil, the cheapest olive oil, one teaspoon in one and a half gallon or two teaspoon in a three gallon backpack sprayer. OK, so the oil, I mean the soap is twice the amount of the soap, but so two teaspoon, four teaspoon, not more, not double. OK, if you have a three gallon backpack sprayer, two teaspoon and then four teaspoon and you are a new made your own insecticidal soap recipe and that's been working well for me. But of course, more and more uh, in, uh, uh, fungicide organic products are available oxygenator. This is the same idea as that uh, brown bottle of hydrogen peroxide you buy from Walmart to sanitize a wound. That's the same idea. It uh, generates oxygen that sanitizes the surface of the plant and kills any diseases. Uh, green cure is another organic uh, fungicide. Uh, this is a new insecticide and miticide by BioWorks. It's called EpiShield. Um, it's a new on the market. I'm just showing you that it is available on the market to give you ideas. Please always, always, always follow the recipe, follow the label. For example, BioWorks EpiShield brand will have its own label. Follow the label and do not be generous. If it says one teaspoon per gallon, don't put one and a half teaspoon. Oh, maybe a little bit more will get me more control. No, you're wasting money and you can cause damage. Please follow the label in whatever you are using. That's why in my recipe here, I said follow my recipe. One teaspoon uh, or two teaspoon for three gallon. Don't double it and say oh, I get more benefit. No. Too much soap can burn the plant. OK, that's a brief overview of pest management. I would love to hear in your survey any of your concern you have, any uh, topics that, or any in specific insect or diseases you like us to uh, uh, address in that online course we like to develop uh, in the future. Uh, system maintenance. Here is the Dutch bucket at the end of the season. Uh, you know you hey uh, you got to clean it. Commercially you dump uh, dump it all and you start with fresh perlite uh, because the labor cost money. Time is money. It's cheaper to fill it with new perlite instead of cleaning it and separating it and recycling it as a home use or as a hobby or as a beginning operation, you're trying to cut your uh, expenses. You can recycle it. Uh, I've done it. I have crops that are growing on the third crop cycle as long as there's no diseases. Like when you clean it, you don't see uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, um, uh, uh, root knot nematode on your tomato roots. You don't see that the tomato roots look healthy. Uh, clean it, separate it, dry it, uh, and then uh, re reuse it. OK, uh, a part of the system maintenance in many of these systems, uh, roots will grow everywhere, especially when they're well fed. Look here, they got into the tubing and they can clog the system. Look at how much roots I got uh, from uh, that Dutch buck, from that tomato that outgrown its space and got into the PVC. Uh, and uh, grown what three foot long. OK. Uh, that's uh, briefly over uh, some of the uh, maintenance, some ideas uh, in the NFT. What I showed you, I did, could not find that uh, video that I've taken, but the small spaghetti tubing in the Dutch bucket or in the NFT that can form a crust on the inside and that can reduce the flow of nutrient solution. So bef when you refill it, check it, open it and see if if, the, if it's uh, the flow is strong enough. If it's trickling, then cut it, uh, soak it in vinegar overnight or cut it, replace it with a new hose while you soak it and soak it in vinegar. Vinegar will dissolve the crust that formed on the inside of the tube and then you can recycle it and use it. 
this uh, supplier and information uh, uh, website or companies. Uh, Hort Americas is a company here in Dallas. They supply all kind of parts and supplies. Uh, they are for commercial growers, but I'm sure if you want to buy a bag of perlite, they'll sell it to you and they're excellent. Check out their HortAmericas.com. They have videos, they have uh, product information, they have articles. It's a great source of information too, not just as a supplier. Bootstrapfarmer.com. You saw they had they sell that uh, 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 grow rack kit, uh, so they sell uh, uh, for homeowner, commercial, hobbyist. They have great videos on podcast. Um, uh, that's a great resource for educational. BWI is uh, if you're a commercial, that's a great resource. Uh, check out they um, uh, they deliver, or you can go to and buy. And of course, greenhouse mega store. Uh, you can buy anything from a spaghetti tubing, flexible, you know, one eighth inch tubing, to a whole greenhouse uh, with the kit, and they'll send even people to come build it for you. Uh, the, and that's not a complete list. This is just a few. Um, I would. Uh, love to hear from you other quickly on the startup cost profits labor all this again uh, that alone the economics that alone can be a whole day class so a typical greenhouse is 30 by 96 let's say about 3000 square feet so let's run the numbers for a 1000 square foot okay just run the number and then this way you say okay i have uh, so a 30 by 96 is about 2.9 times or three times the numbers so let's look at uh, crop seasonal variation startup cost okay so um it, it, i looked up recent prices um texas uh, teaching greenhouse, which is not 30 by 96. It's not the standard commercial size. It's a little bit wider and shorter. Uh, complete kit, I mean, turnkey, everything you need, everything you see here on the outside, not the pots and not the uh, all this, that's $66,000. That's not including land preparation. That's not including the concrete pad if you choose to have a concrete pad. So they've gone up a lot. This used to be like 30,000 maybe five, 10 years ago. A 12 by 12.5, you know, uh, like a homeowner or a master gardener group, whatever, it's $10,000. 18 by 36, $18,000, Not in, again, not including the concrete pad. So these are examples from Greenhouse Mega Store, the one that I just showed you. Uh, the website uh, the price does not include shipping construction the land the concrete pad or anything else you need to produce the benches the utility the irrigation line the ph meter the fertilizer so that's your initial startup cost one of your initial startup costs operating cost with control environment horticulture you can produce a variety of crops okay uh, however we find that most growers who start with 50 crops after five years, they focused on now their list is down to five. OK, or a few that have the same growing needs. This way you become expert at a few crops and try and sort of trying to grow everything from a tomato to a lettuce and everything in between. And each one has a different day length or different uh, uh, season to uh, bet between seeding to harvest and all that. So think about that. Don't get too excited and say, I want to plant 50 different crops to begin with. If you want to be commercial, focus, focus on a few and find the market first who, who that are willing to uh, buy those few. And then when you find the market, uh, start growing and then show them a sample. Or if you are growing them, show them a sample. Tell them this is what I can produce. How much do you need? And of course, they don't want uh, a pallet or a, or a case or a pallet or a box uh, once a week. I mean, they want a truckload. The more you can deliver at one time, the more uh, uh, success you can have dealing with retailers like HEB, Walmart or all this because they want continuous supply, guaranteed continuous supply. OK. Now, in terms of profit, think of profit is depending on weight. So the crop that has a lot of water weight in it, 
because water is cheap relatively uh, and fast production cycle that will give you more fast profit. So for example, percent uh, uh, water to total weight uh, in a uh, lettuce, leafy greens and herbs is much higher than in a tomato. OK, because everything you grow in the lettuce you sell, except the roots, of course, but versus the tomato, you're selling maybe 20 uh, percent, 25 percent of that total yield because you're because you're not selling the stem, you're not selling the leaves and you're not selling the roots. OK, so in terms of profit, basil, chives, lettuce, spinach in the cool season, cilantro and mint in the summer season, those have the highest water weight and fast production cycles. So that will be a good start uh, if you want to be a commercial producer. So let's look at some numbers. I mean, assuming everything runs well, everything is ideal and uh, basil, you have these assumptions. Uh, see uh, 10 days in the germination and then three to five weeks. Um, uh, I mean, uh, for the seedling and then uh, another six weeks uh, from transplanting to harvest and you have a yield of three and a half pounds per tower per cycle. And assuming these assumptions here for basil and for chives, uh, you can study it more closely and assuming you can fit 75 towers per greenhouse and the price is one ounce, one dollar per ounce. OK, so 75. This is the yield per one tower times 75 and times uh, 16. Well, I'll do all the math. So one cycle is 12 weeks for basil, six plus five plus one. Uh, that is three and a half pounds per tower times sixteen dollar per pound times seventy five towers per uh, greenhouse. Seventy five towers. That's forty two hundred every twelve weeks. Another twelve forty two hundred from chives. So both chives and basil. The four eighty four hundred divided by uh, twelve weeks is seven hundred dollar per week revenue. OK, please you do the math and you check my numbers if they're correct. So for an eight months growing season, 32 weeks at a calculated revenue of 700 per week, this example will give you 700 times 32, $50,000. This is at wholesale, it's, but again, that's gross. That's not net. OK. And I got these numbers courtesy of zipgrow.com. You can go to their website. Uh, those, those are the, uh, the companies specializing in the vertical uh, towers, the individual tubes, not the wide one, the one I have uh, with the eight plants per layer. I'm sorry, how long have I been muted? OK, I'm fine. OK, so I noticed that I was muted. It's only been for like uh, 20 seconds. OK, OK, so start the slide. I'll start the slide yes. over again. OK, so these are the estimated. Um, uh, what happening here? Where's the laser pointer? It's gone. Here we go. This is the task time required, how often and how long it takes to do each task. All right, so the weekly total between seeding, transplant. Remember every day you seed, every day you transplant, every day you harvest. Time to check the feeding or fix the fertilizer or check the pH, open, the, open adjust, fix the temperature, harvest all that. Weekly, 18 and a half uh, hours per week total. And here are uh, the temperatures, uh, the heating cost, uh, March, April, May, November, different times, different ch cooling, different uh, expenses. Here is your monthly cost. So but for these four months, 742. These are old numbers uh, and uh, optimistic. Uh, here we have more, uh, uh, less heating cost, more, more cooling cost. 
So the uh, you do all the numbers based on zip grow. Your seed cost $25 uh, seed uh, basal 20 uh, plugs 300 nutrients 200. These are old number, but at that time heating cost 742 from the previous slide. Cooling electrical cost and water 300. That's beautiful. I wish it was like that. It's a lot more miscellaneous cost 2000 total cost 3500. I think this is a lot more. Uh, and they're saying uh, with the 1575 in weekly revenue, you can reasonably estimate $50,400 in revenue. Now these are all estimate. These are old numbers, but the uh, the points I want to get you from the economic aspect uh, that I want to tell you is the bigger you are when you start, the faster you can get in the black, the faster you recover your initial cost and start making profit. If you build two greenhouses attached, you know, like uh, no wall in between them, you you recover your money and start uh, uh, making profit faster than if you build one. If you build four, faster than two. F another point, the uh, fewer crops you start with, the better, because then you can go to Walmart and tell them I can get you a truckload of uh, lettuce per week instead of uh, two cases of lettuce and five boxes of Swiss chard and 10 boxes of microgreens. They don't want that. OK, point number three, do the numbers well, visit growers, talk to companies, talk to an ag economist, uh, you know, uh, do the uh, run, uh, run the numbers, do the math really well before you jump in, because a lot of people uh, get excited and jump in it and then find uh, that they are uh, not making money. And what you don't see here is your income. What price you want to pay yourself annual salary per year? Do you want to live on 50,000 uh, salary per uh, annual salary per year? Uh, what is your salary? Your salary should be part of the expenses and then hopefully have profit so you can pay the labor so you can make profit and save to to buy new equipment or expand or all this. At 50,000, that may sound great, but that's salary on 50,000 per year. A lot of people may not want that salary. OK, but you build three and in four years now you're making 50 per, per each, then 150 is not a bad salary. OK, this is towards the end. Um, uh, I want to tell you that I do give educational tours where we can show them the hydroponic or aquaponic and they love to uh, see me feed the fish and they get splashed uh, when they fish uh, start jumping because they want to eat and they're hungry. I have a YouTube channel where I post a lot of my garden videos or my hydroponic or my aquaponic videos. So go to youtube.com at vegetable doctor or search Masabni, Joe Masabni or add vegetable doctor and you'll get to it. You, that's how it looks. And we have all kind of videos, uh, you know, on fish, on garden, on hydroponic, uh, whatever. Um, come visit us. Uh, the control environment horticulture team is expanding. It used to be Dr. New and I were the research uh, on the production aspect. Now we have ag engineer. We have a, a researcher on studying immunity. Uh, we have entomology, IPM specialist. We're hiring a, uh, a, a breeder. Uh, and we're hire a genomics. So the team is expanding. Uh, and um, I'm going to end with a couple of videos of a tour, maybe like two minutes each uh, of the botany house that I took yesterday and of the rooftop greenhouse. So those will be the last two things we will watch. Let's watch this video. This is taken yesterday. Welcome to the Dallas Center. And this is a tour of my hydroponic systems that I have at the botany house. I've shown you in the presentation various types. Let me show you live systems with plants growing on them. This is what we call Dutch bucket system. And I have here two. 
There's one on the shelf here, the small pen on the on the bench with that tank is one system. It's a closed loop. See the water, the water goes out from the tank, it drips here, and then excess water goes out from the bottom and goes back to the tank. That's what we call closed loop Dutch bucket. Very suited for um, you know, uh, short season crops, anything less than three months. What I did is I have grown my plants in these grow dan cubes, okay? And I put three, this is lettuce, and I put three in each bucket. So when they fill, I mean, I can put four, I can put five, depending on what size uh, uh, the lettuce I wanted at maturity. Okay, so great, great system. This one here, that big tank with these two lines here is also a Dutch bucket system, but that's an open loop uh, type, meaning the nutrient solution comes out with the pump, is delivered to these delivery line that's on top of the bucket, drip here, everything else is the same, drip here, and then the excess water comes out from the bottom, but it does not go back to the tank. It is go, uh, gone to waste. Why we have this? This is for long-term crop, like fruiting vegetables, tomato, peppers, eggplant, cucumber. And that's what I have these here. These will uh, be on above each bucket so that the vine, the tomato vine can climb on it. Why do we have this? Well, in a closed loop system, we know NPK are used up immediately, let's say within a week, but then the micronutrient are not used up completely. So when the tank is, is partially empty and then you refill it, you're adding new solution on top of old solution, the concentration of the micronutrient uh, accumulate and you can possibly reach toxic level uh, over a six month period. Whereas when you have such a system where the solution does not go back, then when the tank is empty, you refill it with the new solution and there's never an issue with old mixing with the new and the concentration getting messed up. So you can build your own. I've seen people using five gallon buckets and um, drilling a hole on the side. And you know, I mean, once you know the, how the system operates, you can build it as a, as a hobby um, from, um, from available parts. So here we have uh, two types of Dutch bucket. Uh, here is the NFT system, nutrient film technique. And uh, it's not planted yet. Basically the nutrient solution is pumped uh, to this end. You see, and because of the slope, um, the water runs down to this end and is collected and goes back to the tank. So here is another closed loop system. This is um, very popular in, in um, uh, all the greenhouse lettuce or hydroponic lettuce that you buy is planted in this uh, format because you can disconnect uh, the water here, turn off the pump, disconnect it here, and that whole uh, line is removable. So it's easy to remove and uh, take it to the harvest table, harvest it, clean it, replant it, and bring it back here. Very few moving parts, no need to add air pump, because let's say in such a system here with the deep water culture, using those foam boards, deep water culture, of course these are not operating now, but imagine this is full nutrient solution and you have an air pump and the foam and the plant sitting on the foam with the roots and the water. These are becoming popular uh, vertical tower and I have two of them, one with lights and one without lights. Uh, and. Uh, the pump at the bottom, that's in the nutrient solution, pumps the water to the top here. And you see how it's, uh, uh, 
has eight folds all around and then it sprays the water and then the water trickles down and that little shelf uh, under the net cup holds a little bit of water so the plant never runs out of water. Okay, so, and then the excess water goes back to the tank. Um, in a four foot, four square foot, I have here 64 plants and 80 plants. So 64 plants in a four square feet compared to 48 plant in maybe uh, four by five and 20 square feet. So this is much better use of space for a homeowner in your, in your patio, inside the house, if you don't mind the, the pump. Of course, it does not need to have the pump running 24 hours. If you choose to have something like this, you can run it on a cycle, uh, let's say, uh, two hours on, two hours off, but then at night, uh, maybe once overnight. Um, you can play with it and see how long it takes this grow dan cube to dry completely. Uh, but I don't think it's going to be an issue if it's, uh, let's say, four hours of uh, off watering time that it will die or will completely. Okay. Over here, I have aquaponic systems and we'll, that will be uh, the discussion of another video in the future. Okay, before I show you the other video, um, the NFT is four by six, so that's so that's uh, uh, 24 square feet, and I had 48 plants. So that's two plants per square foot, whereas that vertical tower had 64 plants in four square feet. That's a footprint, so that is 16 plants uh, per square foot. Uh, that's why uh, the you know going up is a uh, benefit. But if you remember that green uh, picture with the greenhouse where they had my system and I showed you the PVC in and the PVC drainage out, do you remember how far apart they were? They they were far apart, so they don't shade each other. So if you don't have light added to the systems, then what you gain 16 plants per square feet, but then you space them far apart, you may lose some of that advantage. So may it end up being four plants per square feet instead of 16 because the few there per the whole greenhouse, there are fewer plants. So you need light, you need nutrient, you need the air, you need support, you need all that, uh, uh, not just uh, stack them and not right next to each other. They'll shade on each other and you'll lose, uh, you'll, you'll lose efficiency. Let's watch the second video. And welcome to the rooftop greenhouse at the Dallas Center, where we have this section used for our research and we have all kinds of hydroponic systems. In the botany house, I showed you Dutch bucket, NFT, vertical tower. Here, I'm going to show you deep water culture, if you can zoom in. Basically, it's just any tank. You can think of a kiddie pool and you fill it with a nutrient solution and then you have this uh, seedling that is growing in a, uh, in a grow dan cube in rock wool and uh, this mold is made recently made to fit that size. And I can tell that this is new root growth because when I planted them, these were not existent. So it started growing. These were planted a couple of days ago. Uh, so they're just sitting in the water 100% of the time and to avoid root rot, uh, you just add a air stone, you know, like uh, an, an aquarium pump, okay? Cold water holds more oxygen so the plant can live without, uh, lettuce can live without uh, the air pump in the winter, in the cool weather, but in the summer uh, it cannot because warm water does not hold oxygen. But even in the cool weather, when you put an air stone plant would perform better. Okay, and uh, I've shown you the NFT system before. Here we have six um, and we check them a couple of days, uh, a couple of hours later and a day later to make sure that they're all growing well. Um, 
know, uh, you never know, maybe the pump died or whatever. If you want to check them, make it part of your practice, two hours later, four hours later, and then next day, uh, check them, uh, replant anything that would not make it immediately. And they're doing well, and it wouldn't hurt once in a while to lift that and see if it's uh, pouring out or not, or you can listen to the pump or check the pump. Of course, check the water level. Check the water level. We have a pH meter. Uh, we have a, uh, we have acid uh, up or down to adjust the acidity so that to make nutrients available. Uh, and uh, uh, these are 100 parts per million nitrate, which is good enough for uh, leafy greens. If you want to grow uh, uh, fruit and vegetables, then you need 150 parts per million. But anyway, 100 parts per million, but when we refill, we refill with 50 parts per million. Okay, you don't want to add the same concentration because then you'll have imbalance. You have too much of uh, the micronutrient accumulating and it can make all toxicity. Enjoy. Okay. Um... If you want to read more, I want to show you these couple of uh, books here. The one on the left is more detailed. Um, I mean, it says a definitive guidebook. There's really lots of chapters, a lot of detail, really for someone who is serious for commercial growers. Uh, the one on the left uh, and the one on the right is as a beginner for a beginner person who uh, who is interested in it and uh, with instruction on how to build your own, how to design and build your own uh, hydroponic system. So for a hobbyist on the right and for the more serious uh, person who wants to learn the in and outs and how to do it right uh, with the books on the left. With that, thank you very much for being patient and uh, I'm uh, happy to answer any questions you may have. I will stop sharing and, uh, and uh, I'm happy to stay as long as you like to answer any question you may have. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Masabni. We really learned quite a bit from your experience, as well as the instruction that you've provided for us over the past three hours. We do have a few questions. I'll start with one uh, that was asked a little bit earlier by an Aaron Jones. Aaron says, you said at the beginning that when you refill the NFT, you only use half the solution. Could you talk about that? Yes, uh, actually, I just mentioned it in this video. Uh, in the last video, if I, I start with 100 parts per million at the beginning, and then when it's time to refill, I refill it with 50 parts per million solution uh, just to avoid imbalance between the nutrient. Uh, but the ideal way is to measure P, uh, EC and then uh, adjust it accordingly. So um, it never um, fill it uh, with the same solution over and over again, uh, you can run into trouble. Uh, if the if the crop you want to harvest is, let's say, from seeding to from transplanting to harvest is two months, you probably can get away with it because by the time the imbalance and the nutrients become toxic, uh, you harvest it and you and you're out. You see, uh, so. Uh, that's the, uh, the reason we do this is because we don't want uh, the micronutrient to accumulate uh, too much and too fast and cause a toxicity. Excellent. That's great advice. Another interesting question. There are several questions related to growing sweet potatoes and other type of vegetables, but this one I found very intriguing. The question is from Judith Lane. Judith asks, are you and your team expanding any of, any of your technology and systems to developing countries? Um, no, that's not our role. Um, you know, we are extension and we serve the people of Texas. Uh, of course, I do get calls. I do get visitors from uh, other countries and uh, they look, they take a tour and they want advice and, uh, and I try to help them with their considering their limitations. Like here, you can go online or order anything that's available. Many developing countries, they may not have the supplies or if they have it, they have to order it 
and then wait two months for it to arrive. So considering these limitations, we have, some, we have to adjust the advice. Uh, so I help. I help anybody that uh, knocks on my door. I mean, figuratively speaking, but I, I, I do, we don't actively uh, take our work because we're uh, here to serve uh, Texas. Excellent. That's a that's a uh, excellent advice. Consultation is always open, but you're right. We are here to serve our our constituents in Texas. Absolutely. Um, there is one uh, question and um, uh, just a real shout out. Thank you again for your uh, support, Dr. Masabni, uh, Brandy Keller, uh, and Shannon Sullivan from Harris County, myself from Galveston County. We have talked to Dr. Masabni. We will. We look forward to working with Dr. Masabni in local programs. Um, here this next year, and we'll be working that out and letting our constituents know. Uh, this one question is, uh, you mentioned growing sweet potatoes. Um, can you quickly explain how a root crop can go in this type of system, and mostly because of the length of time it takes to really grow this uh, this uh, vegetable mm -hmm. out? Yeah, um, uh, in aeroponic, in Dutch buckets, in uh, the flood and drain, uh, like the media bed uh, that I showed you, uh, I have grown uh, sweet potatoes and my colleague who's a potato breeder on campus, uh, they grow uh, potatoes, the breeding line uh, in their uh, aeroponic system, the one with the misting from the bottom. And, and like I said, she opens it, takes uh, one mature fruit and closes and the plant continues to grow and make a new uh, new potatoes, not fruits, new potatoes. So um, it, it can grow. I mean, uh, remember the plant, you supply it nutrients, you supply it light, you supply it physical support, you protect it from insects and diseases, and it will grow. Uh, that potato can grow in the air if you give it all its needs. Uh, it uh, does not have to be in the soil, in this specific type of soil uh, to, to do well. So, um, of course, um, the challenge with potato and sweet potato is in that Dutch bucket because of the physical limitation, it's going to run out of space to expand versus in the soil that can get you, give you a bigger yield. So, uh, physical space limitation can become an issue. But I've grown potato in my, uh, uh, in my uh, uh, deep water culture and they did fine. I mean, uh, you think that the roots are sitting in water all the time and the potatoes did well and <laughs> problem actually they did, they grew very well as long as that air pump never died. Ah, fascinating. I'll have to try that out ourselves with our own hydroponic system here at the gardens. Well, Dr. Masabni, we do thank you for your time. I'll turn it over to Brandy for uh, closing remarks. Uh, Brandy? Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Thank you, Dr. Masabni. This was uh, this was this was so great. It, it definitely ex it uh, exceeded my expectations. Um, I just wanted to see if there was anything else before we we talk about a couple events. Is there anything else that you would like to put out, um, or maybe even just talk about real quickly the survey that we're going to do and what yes. you're looking for from current producers. Yes, uh, current producers, current uh, hobbyists, current people who are read or research or, or are interested in hydroponic, we're going to send you a few questions. Uh, your answers will be appreciated because it will help us guide uh, in the, the development of the course, the online course that will be available for you uh, in the future. Because I want to develop the course that answers the questions, real life questions and needs instead of what I think your needs are. So tell me, you know, hey, I had to go to this website and that website to learn this, or I couldn't find a resource that talks about this, or I love to learn more about insects. I couldn't find that kind of advice uh, will be greatly appreciated. And uh, Brandy is generous to give you uh, gifts, and I'm giving you also uh, a gift uh, to encourage you to fill the survey and return uh, the uh, your answers to us. 
Yes, um, any way we can get those surveys from you, we will accommodate. Um, <laughs> so um, just real quick, uh, I have a program coming up in, uh, it's actually Urban Harvest Program in Houston that uh, I'm, I'm helping out with. It is Women in Ag on December 8th. Uh, you can probably find it online. If you need more information, I can send you some, uh, but it is Women in Ag. It is gonna take place at the University of Houston downtown on a Friday on December 8th. It is hosted by Urban Harvest and um, this will be the second one. So uh, it's we're, we're building upon the one from last year. And Stephen, do you have any upcoming events you would like to talk about? Yes, we're right in the middle of a pecan show. So Ooh. we're accepting <laughs> submissions for pecans up until December the 6th. Our colleague in Fort Bend County, Boone Holiday, horticulture agent there, has a successful pecan show and he's uh, concluding in a couple of weeks. But uh, for our county, we're we're continuing on all the way to December 6th. We'll have a, a show uh, really soon after. So um, just a little shout out. If you got pecans, bring them on to the office if you're local. We'd love to okay. have you. Great. Well, thank I have you. A I have a yeah. program. Uh, of course, it's more tailored for commercial growers for control environment. It's the fifth annual control environment conference. So that's really it's $150 or $100 virtual. So that's not for the hobbyists because it's a lot of companies. But hey, anybody's welcome. You pay, we'll, we'll have you. Uh, we have excellent lunch, excellent dinner, and next day a tour of Eden Green, the one with the vertical tower I told you in Cleburne, uh, south uh, of uh, Fort Worth. Uh, a tour is included with that registration. It's a great opportunity if you are a serious grower and you want to meet a lot of industry and a lot of producers uh, and uh, uh, that, uh, that are of your interest. That's December 7 and the tour is December 8. All right, great. Well, um, we did just run a little bit over. I want to uh, keep as close to, as possible. Uh, thank you, Dr. Misabni, uh, Shannon Sullivan, Stephen Bergerhoff. Uh, this was a really great program and enjoyable. And please fill out those surveys. We will do, I'll give you some time next week to fill them out. Um, and uh, we'd appreciate that. And we'll do uh, the drawing next week. So, have a great rest of your Saturday, and thank you for joining this Texas A&M AgriLife Extension program. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.